We had AOL growing up. <clears throat> yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, instant messenger, baby. Oh yeah. What was your name? That's how I was getting all my checks. Uh Lil Flinner. <laughs> Lil Flinner. <laughs> no, no, of your social media account. <laughs> yeah. I like to just... X, 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 Lil Flynn. I like to just break Lil through Flynn. break through all the transparency and just let them know. What, what was yours, JP? With. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm-hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack sprayer and that since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost and for everyone listening use hunter 15 to receive 15 percent off any deer grow products on the deergrow.com website and we're back hey uh hunter podcast episode 71 in the studio mr mike lauer welcome sir Hello, boys. Straight out of Indiana, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Born and raised. Born and raised, you know. Town of Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> right across Southampton Philly. People don't understand the old Jimmy Stewart airport up there, you know. Yeah. They just extended it. Historical place. Never flown out of it, never flown into it. I didn't know planes still flew in and you know, Jimmy out of that. was a big time air. Obviously, if you know anything about Jimmy Stewart, he was a war hero, flew a lot of planes, mm-hmm. and right in front of my grandma's house and on the property I was, you know, Born and raised on learning how to hunt. That's where he that was his personal airstrip. What would be Jimmy's biggest role? Uh, miracle and is he a miracle on Thirty Fourth Street or something? Or the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the the Christmas movie. Yeah, miracle. <laughs> That's what it was, right? It's a wonderful life. It's a wonderful life. That's yeah. it. There you go, Jimmy Stewart. A little before my time. A little before all of our times. <laughs> Black and white. But how old are you, Mike? Thirty-two. Okay, yeah, you're a little older than me, but younger than Jeremy. Like Twenty-nine. Turn 29 March. You'll see 30 soon. Yeah. Not before my wife. Mm. As I like to remind mm-hmm. her. Shout out to Paige. Mm-hmm. Paige is the best. The old day. Mar- you know what? We were talking about it earlier, Mike. Obviously, uh, us Pennsylvania guys stick together. It's like going to snow this weekend. Mm-hmm. It's ridiculous. Part for the course. Yeah. Mid-April, snow. Not good for the dairy mart business for ice cream. Uh, well, that's fine. Uh, People like ice cream even when it's cold outside. Oh, mm-hmm. well, we yeah, I've hot hot food too. So, oh, there you go. I keep telling JP, you got to put a stand up in PNC Park, right next to Dippin' Dots. I was like, do we still have a baseball team? <laughs> <laughs> I did see uh, just a little bit ago. We have a three percent chance of making the playoffs. We are the wow. lowest in baseball. So you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> there's a fifty percent chance I'm gonna get dipping dots <laughs> and see Paige. I tried to talk shit on dipping dots to Jared and I was like, We gotta get dipping dots out of there. I was like, Hey, I gotta take that back. Dipping dots is pretty good. Gotta uh-huh. push them, really, gotta push them. I really like dipping dots. Melt in the mouth. Oh mm. uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know I don't days. know if PNC fills the park anymore. They do a lot of music events over there, I think now. That's where I saw Goo Goo dolls and I had to leave. Because it was like, it was so bad. It was going to ruin Iris Don't for ruin me. that for me. I walked out. <laughs> Don't go I was like, because I love this song so much and they're about to play it and everything's been terrible up yeah. until this point. So I left. And uh, I still enjoy the song. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of music, we recently lost uh, Taylor Hawkins, drummer for Food Fighters. That was a disappointment yeah, for me, that. man. Dude, didn't their last drummer die spontaneously? Like, uh, No, Taylor's been there since the get-go for Food Fighters. Was there somebody? Really? Yeah. You think in Nirvana? That would have been Dave Grohl, who's still alive. No, something else happened with that Taylor dude. Well, he's been a drug addict. Right, I know. Mm-hmm. He was with Alanis Morissette for Ooh, a while. There's a name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, one hand in my pocket type of thing. I've Before seen the Foo Fighters a few times. Have I've seen you? Seen at the Pete. Yeah, they were great. I've seen him at Console. Yeah, I liked Foo Fighters a lot. That was one of my Some iconic. You see, was that you that puked in that? Uh... <laughs> I'm not a puker. You know what, dude? I was coming to your apartment one time. Remember we used to live right Washington above there? Plaza? Yeah, yeah. Right yeah. next door. Yeah, I was walking up there and it was like it was a few fi- food fighters concert. Somebody had puked in the uh <laughs> the probably, parking garage walking up and I was like, yeah. Probably talk, I'm not a puker. No. I'm like Jerry Seinfeld. I haven't puked it since nineteen seventy one. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> the old uh, gut rumbles. 
So, well, anyways, I guess I'll introduce Mike. Yeah, Mike, introduce. Mike is just my my longtime buddy from um, college. I met you in college. I don't know if we were going to the same college at that point, or how exactly did we meet, Mike? Well, I'm glad you remember. <laughs> well, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Yesterday. Um, Mutual friend. Zach. Uh, Snyder. Mike, Mike DeMarco's roommate. Zach Snyder. I guess so. Okay. I'd always show That's up. That's right. And Zach would be like, I would be up. hanging out at his house, and he would be like, dude, you should really meet my... I yeah. totally forgot about that. <laughs> I gave him the Steve voice. <laughs> Go ahead. I'll let you tell it. But yeah, I just... He's like, you got to meet my buddy, man. He's in all this same, same stuff. And it was like a first date. Jared and I and are you guys at the same college we at this Duquesne. point? You yeah. both are at Duquesne. Which, no offense, neither of you remind me of Duquesne material. No. <laughs> like, no. If, if I wore this shirt in the class, they'd be like, dude, that's so bro. Well, dude, that's, are you in? that's why our buddy Zach was like, dude, you got to meet my other guy. He's like, he's crazy like you, man. Oh, uh, yeah. And we went into Jack's ball. We played pool. Mm -hmm. We drank Jack. We did, cakes. dude. I forgot mm -hmm. about a lot of this. And then, and then, like, at the end of it, he was that like for our first date? We went like to Jackson, played pool. Because it was like I've never been back there since. But it was like I've never met a Duquesne guy like this. Mm -hmm. I hope I don't come on too strong. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. want to I don't scare him away. Should I ask for his number? Yeah, but like there's none of that. <laughs> Should like, I break out a turkey call yet or no? <laughs> oh, I hope he liked it. It I was it was hard. like a date, hard. dude. We we're like, hey, we should get together. We should let's meet at Jacks. Yeah, how we funny is that? Jacks, and then we met up, and I never forget this. We met up at at the apartment on Washington Street. This girl was dating at the time on. Up on uh, Mount Washington. Yeah. The house he lived in for a long and, time. And he goes, no, no bullshit. He goes, hey, you know what? We're going to go to Ohio next week. You're going to meet my parents. And I was like, wow, this date's going so good. <laughs> like, Already? He really likes me. But yeah. And then we hunted with Kuhar yeah. the next week. And we doubled. You shot a bird without yeah. a ground blind with a bow. Yeah. And then Kuhar <laughs> shot a bird earlier that morning. Got them both on film. Awesome footage. So the same day. Same day. We shot two birds? First hunt. And he would have known that because I, I told that story at his wedding, but he wasn't paying attention. No. Yeah. He's I was having some of them strawberry lemonades. Yeah. <laughs> I like how you set up this room, kind of like this podcast at Jared's wedding. And it was like in a barn stall or something. Oh, yeah. And it was just a camera. <laughs> and it was like, this, a, yeah, this was a recipe for disaster. It was like, like it was like, hey, leave a message for the wedding guest. And it was like a private oh, room oh with a God. camera in it. <laughs> After the fireworks. And I just, I don't know. I was dancing. What else is going on? I never saw the video. I, I remember I it. found it and I was like, oh, yeah. I have to go crazy. It was one thing. of those things I watched it afterwards and it like it wasn't as funny as like you <laughs> thought it was at the time. <laughs> I just remember his dad being like, that was the best. Oh, like, Dwayne. Oh, Dwayne. Shout out to Dwayne. Dwayne's going to Kansas with us this year. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. yeah. I'm super stoked about That'd that. would be really cool. Big Dwayne guy. Mm. You're big, you're big man guy. Big well, I mean, it, it was big, like, big, 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 big so here's guy. like two rednecks in like downtown Pitt, downtown Pittsburgh, growing like food plots and oh, trying yeah. to. For the record, I don't really identify as a redneck. I don't, I don't care for the term. Oh, I'm sorry. Was that derogatory <laughs> to yeah, you? A little bit <laughs> from Ohio. Yeah, yeah I'm just like I'm an educated, you know, bow hunter, so. sophisticated uh, redneck. Yes, yeah, I'm sophisticated. I draw mm -hmm. compounds, so. He, tuck, he tucks in his, his camo. Oh, yeah. So, but sorry, it's always matching. Just had to correct you there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, dude, that is one of my biggest pet peeves. I don't even like to wear camo anymore because I'm trying to, you know, like I'll wear this turkey hunting. That's pretty much camo. It's kind of camo. I think that's a death sentence on most game lands in Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> that's like who gets hurt more than any other sport in, you know, in the hunting realm? Turkey, turkey hunters. hunters. Yeah. 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 Red, white, and blue, baby. What about injuries? Turkey hunters on the first day or... Trout fishermen on the first day. Oh. Injuries total. Yeah. I, I, I actually have seen... Is it a lot? No. Probably like hooks and uh, slips and falls. I've and seen a lot of incidents on uh, opening day deer as well. For instance, I think two people in my family have almost cut a finger off cutting pepperoni, you, you know, go. on the on, <laughs> on yeah. the ground. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, total injuries. Yeah. Turkey hunting's is definitely up there. I mean, so, that's, I mean that's, fatalities, I'm going to go with turkey or deer. Yeah, my dad's sure. been yeah. shot. For turkey? Oh, yeah. Yeah. He got shot right in the back, Colin. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> just running, ah, running away. Jesus. <laughs> Get back the, here. <laughs> got Damn, shot in the back. Man. That's crazy. Yeah. It is. I mean, it's one of the, I, I've been sprayed a lot, grouse and pheasant hunting. Yeah. You, you know? good shot too? But just sprayed, mm -hmm. you know, not like penetrated the skin type of thing. But. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I don't identify as a redneck, but Mike and I are our friends and we were at You were hardcore bow hunters in downtown Pittsburgh. He had an archery range set up mm -hmm. on what was that street lived on? Sarah Street? Larkin, 18th Larkin and Larkin. Street. And did you make Larkin. a food plot too? Uh, at his house. Yeah, at Mike's house. No, I had a little bit of space, maybe like a 10th <laughs> acre. And I went up there this past year, which has been, we made it five years ago, and there's still deer 
hitting that same perennial plot. That's Not just deer. Funny. There was a giant. Oh, two, probably close to what? 200 inches? No. I'm over 40. <laughs> no. Anytime I say something. <laughs> like 160. Yeah. Like, yeah maybe. By now he'd be 200. That was a July. That's a big deer. Well, you saw that booner that got killed down there. I don't think it well, was the and, same deer, but and was, Mike sent me video of yeah. one. I don't know if it was in velvet or not, but it was, it, it was giant. Monster. Yeah. yeah. Big deer. Right giant to, in Shout the out to deer grow. Yeah, yeah. Right. We planted a perennial plot. That's probably one of the first food plots deer grow ever planted. Yeah. hundred percent. Right Dude. I mean, it was literally like, so it was like 2013. <laughs> oh, I got pictures. 14. Something yeah. like that. I've been 14. Yeah, my little hand seater out there, and we used to shoot bows off of. And then, Mike, uh, Mike was like on the fifth floor or whatever, so it was like the was steepest 14. decline you've ever shot. Because I shot my elk that year. It was like sixty yards. You shot it for twenty. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to hold different on it. <laughs> really good Fourth of July parties. There was like three tiered deck overlooking you know town, and you could see the fireworks and hear the bat hitting the ball at PNC Park back when the Pirates used to play there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, man. That's crazy though. To think it was that that probably was. I mean, because we we started Deer Grow officially in thirteen, but fourteen was the first year we sold stuff. So I mean, that was probably one of the first plots that we used it with. Yeah. Well, yeah. dude, it would have been you know buck advisor days. Like I was. Yeah, that was buck advisor. Days I don't know if sure. it was the very first batch, but one of the very first batches of Deer Grow. Steve and I mixed in his garage, mm -hmm. and I probably yeah. took some of that for this food because we were still figuring out what formulas we were going to put together That's to right. actually put into a single thing. And then we sent, this is when you applied at like st as Stillwater Farms, the manager yeah. of Stillwater Farms. Yeah. Fam I was like, farm manager. I was like, what is this farm? Oh, that's your family's property. Yeah, I manage a thousand acres of uh, private property for <laughs> quality white-tailed deer. And we sent like a 55-gallon drum up. Yeah, I still have it. Still sitting yeah. up there. Start and boost. Yep. Yeah. That's it, man. That's funny. Yeah, I think it's interesting that just we're such a unique kind of group of people when you can like identify someone like you in a crowd from like in a crowd of like people that are not like you. You're just like, Oh, that guy, that that's a serious hunter over there. Dude, it's you know, so, that guy might hunt, but that guy's serious. It's so it. easy, man. I legitimately, like I feel confident enough in it now. Like I can walk up to the people at the gym and I'm like, you hunt, don't you? And they're like, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It's not yeah. even that I was out in Wyoming last year. I'm sitting at the bar, I'm getting a little lunch, getting a little burger, getting a little drink. And we just finished riding horses in the morning, and there were fires everywhere out there. And we're near Laramie, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. And this helicopter was just parked right outside the, the bar and grill where we were at. And I look over, and I go to my buddy Steve Johns and Christy, and I go, that's a helicopter pilot. Go, How can you tell? I go, he's about 35 pounds overweight, and he's got big, thick suspenders. <laughs> I go, that is 100% the helicopter <laughs> pilot. And there was a lot of people with this. Yeah. Little, and you know, I asked him, I was just like, hey, how's it going out there today? And he pulled lots of water. And my buddy, and, you know, my buddy John's like, how the hell did you know? Because you could just smell it on them. <laughs> you know, it's just that uh, they, they emit like a certain energy. It's it's so weird. I mean, and we come from a different culture out here, but you go west, like when we were in the Dakotas and stuff, and like we're sitting in that little bar. It was one of like the best meals, at least at that time in our mind, that we had ever ate at this like little bar in North Dakota. And not, but like you walk in and everybody just like instantly looks and they're like, yeah, that guy's not from around here. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about that meal we had in the basement? The one, yeah. Yeah, dude, that was amazing. Yeah, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. Did I ever tell you about that? What is it? What is <clears throat> the spot that we mule deer hunt out in North Dakota. Like, it's, I mean, the, almost the entire town is shut down. Yeah, like, there, it's closed. Like, desolate. There's no gas station. There's, I don't, there might be a little, like, three, four-room hotel, but it's obviously booked. Yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing there. And uh, there is a... There is apparently like a, a bar, a, bar. A, a little bar. And it was the only place we would see cars when we drove back in from hunting. There's like cars there, but we figured like, oh, that's a local bar. We walk in there and like people break Jared's face basically. Yeah. Yeah. It was yeah. like a weird spot, but like on, on the way to that, if, if you want to even call it a town, there was, we stopped at a little gas station and we, I just asked, uh, I was like, Hey, is there you know, a place to eat down here or something? And she's like, oh, the food at this bar and grill is, is amazing. And I was like, really? Okay. You know, we're like, yeah, that's where we're staying. We're like, that's right where there. we're staying. So the very last day, uh, we, we had a whole tough week of hunting. We didn't even kill anything. Um, but, but we wanted to go eat at this restaurant and we went down there and it was legit like a five star. Like, I mean the guy, the, you, like the, the homemade bread comes out and homemade salads and it's all like handmade dressings and stuff. Like it's blowing your mind. It was amazing. Then the chef comes out and you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. Cause he's like this like old it, biker dude with a limp. Yeah. And it, like the the lady had said, like what he traveled the world and he was a five star chef and like he wanted to come back here. And I mean, you're eating the food that you're like, yes, I believe it. Then he comes out and you're like, what? Yeah. What did you What did you order? 
Uh, we had we did steaks. steaks. Yeah. What was on the menu? Mostly. St- well, so it was the, well, we the ribeye was the special. Yeah. yeah. Um, but we got salads and stuff. Somebody got Italian. I don't remember. What'd you get? We you got Italian? <laughs> we did an appetizer and I did dessert too, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I mean, and it Try was that. it was crazy. But I mean, you're I'm talking like out of this world. Like I can't believe somebody cooked like that in this place. Yeah. It was yeah. pretty cool. Uh but yeah, when we walked in, like we walked through the bar and everybody's like, Who the hell are these? We're like, guys? is this the restaurant? They're like, it's back there. I think we were the only people there. Yeah, it was like a little Italian joint. For a little while. Yeah, you know, it was Great food. We well, probably ate there every night. What was the name of it? Oh, oh I know the town. I don't want to say it on the podcast. Yeah, though. we can't give that away. I don't want to give away tags. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know that. Yeah, that place to be. We'll it's figure it out. There. I'll yeah. figure it out. I'll Google it. Yeah, but it, those are the kind of places that you know. Because we drove into Montana, and that was more of a town town. Although we had some barbecue from like a little roadside place that we remember. We walk into was it True Value. We walk into True Value because we need a an adapter for uh, like a one ten volt, basically yeah. for our camper. And we get in there, and we I called this guy explicitly explained what we needed. Right? After driving twenty four hours, realizing we needed a specific hookup for the trailer, yeah, making a specific call to this guy and saying, "Here's exactly what I need." Male versus female, clear. We get there, dude is high as hell, <laughs> right? And he's like, "Yeah, man, here it is." And we're like, "No, dude, like that's a female. Like we've said, we already we don't need oh. this." He's like, "Oh, here it is, anyway. man." <laughs> yeah, he didn't understand the male female concept. And then when I explained it to him, he's like, "Oh, <laughs> I get it, man." He's like, "You're all the way here." Yeah. Well, here's Mountain Dew. If you're he's, like, he's like, have you guys ever been to Montana? We're like, yeah, we're here now. He's like, oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. I shot my deer in Montana, man. <laughs> Real good. Yeah, super tender, man. It's like Ben Stiller meet the parents uh, when he goes up to the store, the counter, and he's like, hi, I need to get like a really good expensive like uh, bottle of champagne, like an $80, $100 bottle. And he's like, uh, the <laughs> champagne we got's mums. It's on sale for fourteen ninety five. And Ben Stiller's like, "Do you have like an eighty or a hundred dollar bottle?" Mm. You can get a bunch of mums. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. Fortunately, they had the adapter. Yeah. And then he also recommended us. He's like, "Yeah, man." He's like, "It's like lunchtime, and that barbecue place is awesome down there." We're like, "All right, well, this guy knows." Let's get it. It was pretty good. Yeah, I, I, I took his word on the food. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, this place, those kind of experiences. And that's like a, that's a gas and oil town. Like, I mean, that's all the people that are like in and around yeah. that area. Yeah. But yeah, it's that whole area. But when you're an Easterner, right. And you go out there, it's just like whole different world. Yeah. You know, you, you see another hunter, you know, walking through, you're like, Oh, there's a guy, you know, back here. It's like guys everywhere. You done any Western hunts? Mike, I know you, oh, did yeah, you kill several. a moose? I know you've been on a moose hunt. Several moose hunts. Never pulled the trigger on a moose. But my uh, probably my favorite Western hunt would either be bear or elk with a bow. Mm-hmm. I don't know what I'd. How many elk have you killed? I know you killed just, just one. The one, one I can remember. Yeah, you got that on film too, right? Oh yeah, that was awesome. You can hear my heart beating. Yep. through the GoPro on my forehead. I'm going back on an elk hunt this year. You know that? Yeah, going you telling me. I tell you. Yeah, yeah. Fun. I think. Uh, I don't know if we haven't figured it out yet, but we might have to put the Dakotas on hold. I think that's the plan is to, we got to apply, right? Did we already apply? We put in for North Dakota. South South Dakota at some point is, uh, it doesn't matter. Over the counter. Yeah. Yeah. The drought out there is really rough still. In Mm -hmm. fact, I saw there was a big snowstorm that was coming maybe this week that on the Eastern part was going to drop like eight to 12 inches of snow, but like a dusting out West, like, Mm -hmm. and that's not going to do anything. It's been so dry since we left in 2020. Um, it's yeah. been dry, and they've had EHD issues, and the cattle have now moved up into the Badlands because they need to graze somewhere, and it's pushed a lot of those deer out. But, yeah, I think we'll probably hang tight minus Kansas um, this year. I said I was almost thinking more of a scheduling conflict. I got this, <clears throat> this elk hunt. Sure. You know, it's we, too we've much. got Kansas. It's like, dude, I, you know, it's too much. we can only sustain so much, you know. Yeah. You ever done any hunts up in, like, the far northwest? No. Um, in fact, I was just talking to a guy the other day who lives up in uh, southern Washington, um, and those guys really want me to come out to the Pacific Northwest, and it sounds like it'd be a cool place to go. Yeah. Don't what? Whole different world up there. Uh, they've got blacktail. There's some elk in the when you get towards the eastern ranges mm. on that stuff. Who do you know out there? Um, that's where John West and now oh, yeah, America yeah. crew. They're all just north of Portland over into the Washington side. Nice. Um, I think... I guess I won't speak for us, but I think Jeremy and I want to do a Canadian, Alberta, or Saskatchewan, or Manitoba. 
Manitoba's great. I've got I've got really good Manitoba contacts too. Yeah, a com- a yeah. Canadian mule deer hunt is uh, mm. that's on the bucket. I list. think I think just, just the remote hunt animal. like that feels like it's necessary. Like there are places like I, I you know people will say like ah oh, you can't get away from people. There's places in Pennsylvania, man, you can get and hike back in and and you're not going to encounter people. I mean it oh, no feels doubt. it feels desolate. It feels mm. great. Yeah. Um, but there's something else about like if you're in that that northern tier Wilderness. of like a Manitoba or something. I mean that's pure like it's one road in, one road out. Mm. You know, no winter maintenance type of thing. Or it's all float plane. Well, yeah. Last time I went in Manitoba, mm-hmm. we flew into Manitoba, mm-hmm. Winnipeg. Oh yeah. From Winnipeg, uh, a native drove us to another airport, which is on a lake, mm-hmm. and we took off from that airport to a smaller airport, and then we met a De Havilland Beaver on a lake and took that De Havilland Beaver. To another lake, and then we had a final flight on the on the last day of travel, two full days of travel, on a little island, probably about maybe an acre or two, on, in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you see the northern lights, and it's mostly all natives up yep. there that are your guides. Yep. This dude, his name was uh, Slim. And where were you hunting moose? Uh bear. Bear. Yeah. And uh, you know, you go out and you fish during the day. A bear hunt's great because you yeah. sleep in, fish all day long. Yep. You're eating great food, and then you go sit from three o'clock in the afternoon. Gets dark at what one a.m. Mm-hmm. And you know you hunt, but there was this guy. His name was Slim, Native American kid. He was awesome, and he would grab your pike when you'd catch him, and he would like pull him in and hold him up. Well, the pike was going crazy, and a treble hook went right into the fat in his hand, mm. and the hook went up in and out through, and he just like without thinking, just grabbed a pair of pliers and just ripped him right out. I was like, oh man! And at the end of the the hunt. I said goodbye to him and I gave him like 50 bucks. So you have to ask the guide first yeah. if you can tip this young kid. He's like, yeah, don't give him any more than like, you know, 20 bucks. And I was like, well, I got a 50. I don't have any 20s. He goes, oh, fine. I'm like, well, he had that hook in his hand. I want to give him a little <laughs> extra. And I gave, you know, gave it to him and I was like, here you go, Slim. I'm like, hey, thank you so much. You know, great experience, you know, fishing with you. So what are you going to do with that 50 bucks though up here? Because they don't yeah. have a Walmart or, and he goes, I'm going to order a video game. <laughs> I was like, cool. <laughs> cool, man. He's like, yeah, that's all I got. But yeah, you're a wildlife biologist. I am. And, you know, we're at a podcast. We're having fun. We're drinking mm-hmm. some bourbon. Mm-hmm. Can I tell you about, in addition to that hunt, same hunt, mm-hmm. the day that I harvested my bear, I had a, what I would consider an unexplained encounter oh. with what I would call the Bigfoot. Some some mysterious creature. Like, I never got an I I never saw it. Okay. Were you on any psychedelics at the time? No, I was <laughs> eighteen. <laughs> Which answer the question? Means, but, uh, is that, is that no, your, answer. Is that your <laughs> final answer? Okay. Sober, so you're in the middle of nowhere. Sober, focused, young on man. a tree stand with a bait barrel. I assume up there. Yep. So it took. We portaged from define sober. Island. Well, I no beers during the day. I would say <laughs> nothing. Like as baseline as yeah. I could get. Mm-hmm. And. You know, and I had the our guide, his name was Dave, Super Dave, mm-hmm. and Super Dave dropped, you know, dropped the boat off at one portage, yep. just connecting one lake to another. Yep, drove through one portage to another, so I'm really far away mm-hmm. from Hamburger Island, and mm-hmm. everything's so flat out there, you can hear yeah. everything. Yep, so you know when your boat's coming to pick you yep. up on most days. Well, this I was the last day, I was the last hunter that didn't kill. I was way out these two portages. I got dropped off. I got dropped off at like noon, and a big snowstorm came through. It was like first week of June. And I'm hunting and everything, and you just get like that intense. Sure. Like when you know a deer's behind you. Oh yeah. You don't. The you old, know what we're talking. The about. old sixth sense. Sixth sense. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "What is behind me?" I'm like trying to look, and I, you know, things were weird. And then all of a sudden, about an hour later, in comes this monster bear, just big, brewing, gnarly, 18 inch skull, you know, Pope and Young book bear, and, and he just comes in, just huffing. So probably other bears. Sure. Is what I'm indicating like I yeah. heard something, yep. smelled something behind yep. me. And here he comes. So he comes right into the bait. I pulled the OG two Buckmaster back up with mm-hmm. the uh, with the uh, the G five Montec. Just put one perfect, and he ran about 10 yards. And bears die quick. Yeah. If and you hit him right. <laughs> if you hit him right, and and you know, especially with an arrow. Yeah. And he kind of laid down, did the death moan and everything. And it's so here's where maybe. So now it's dead quiet. Yes. Right. And you know what it's like. Oh, yeah. So now I'm thinking, oh, man, do I get down? I'm all alone. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm kind of a new hunter. I'm 18. Yeah. Like, I'm not like a 32 year old guy. Mm-hmm. And I felt this crazy presence. After I see the bears done it, and yeah. it's been about 20, 30 minutes yeah. after it expired. And I heard the inmist- unmistakable noise of a wood knock. And you hear about on, you know, Discovery Channel about the wood knock. And it just sounded like, knock. Oh, I've heard. That's all I hear from my dad. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm thinking to myself, holy shit. 
So I get the, down. The knock. And I and the guy told me, he's like, if you do kill one, you know, and you're cold, make a fire and I'll, yep. you know, pick yep. up whatever. I'll be here at like two in the morning. Yep. So it's like. You can't call him. No, no radio. No, no radio, nothing. no service. Yeah. There's not, I mean, I am in the middle of nowhere all alone. Seems like radios would help. And they probably would, but we didn't have radios. <laughs> no radios. He did give me a rifle. Okay. 270. Just and, in uh, case. Yeah, just like, you know, whatever. Yep. And uh, so I get down out of the stand and I'm a little bit like worked up. What was that? One. <clears throat> Knock. Just a single knock. Just a single knock. What was that? And it's dead quiet. So it's, it's just still like, quiet. Yeah. Nothing. It's not mm-hmm. dark out. It's no. no it's like it's. It doesn't really get super dark out up that far north. No. But it was not ten o'clock. I mean, it was yeah. very yeah. very well lit, like six o'clock in the afternoon. Yep. And um, I went down. I went and I grabbed my bear and I'm taking selfie pictures. Back whenever we had the cameras. Oh yeah. The eight mega. You know, eight mega yeah. or eight gig. And I'm taking selfies, and I heard it again. Single knock. And so I pick up a stick. You know, a spruce branch, because you're in the bush. It's mm-hmm. pretty thick. Mm-hmm. And I just smacked it as hard as I could against this branch, or yep. against another tree. Yep. Knock. Heard another hit. I was like, oh. And so, like a call and response at this So point. I did what Stan Potts would do in a scrape. I peed all over my bear. <laughs> I was like, I gotta get back up. So I you peed on your bear? All over it. <laughs> all over it. There's no, nobody's taking my bear. So I ran up, and I'm like... <laughs> I'm scared, you know? And so I'm like, so I go. That's mountain lions you're thinking of, by the way. I don't even, yeah. That's what that works for. He's like, I peed on my face, too. I don't know I what to do. Yeah, yet he doesn't give a crap. He's, he's taking it. <laughs> yeah. You know. So I went up, and now I went up into my tree stand, and there's a 270 up there. I brought my bow down. And <laughs> yeah. so I have my you 270. You probably should have brought that down with you. I wasn't thinking. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Same thing. I heard a knock. So I am up in the tree. And stand. I mean, are you? Is it like moving? Moving. S- moving. It's 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 all on this hillside, and I'm my back is against the lake, and we're in a swamp. Yep. So it's coming closer. It's just like when you strike a gobbler. Oh and yeah. You know he's you know working, he's moving, and yeah. you know he's moving, and so this thing's like communicating with me, like almost like telepathically, like I could feel it. And so I went down out of my tree because I was freaking out, and I took a, you know I had the, the gun like put on my hip, mm-hmm. and I hit again two two or three hits. And then it did two or three hits, and I'd go over and I'd go over towards. Are you the lake. thinking Yeti at this point? Hundred percent. I was like, F- but that's the problem. You, you know, you think it and yeah. then you believe it. Yeah. And it, you know, went back and forth for a, a while, and then I got a little scared, and I lit a fire. And when I lit a fire, I heard a branch break really close to me, and I heard knocks r- like in the bush. You can see maybe twenty, thirty yards. Yeah. And it was, I'd say fifty. Hmm. And so I pulled out the two seventy, and I fired three shots. <laughs> Like, uh, not in directly into the bush. Sure. Like, hop bush. Up, uh, you like, walk warning over shots. your guides, like, oh. <laughs> Problem was. A bald eagle falls out of a tree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Problem was, the guide, sh- I was signaling the guide, like, I'm early, I'm finished, yeah. I'm done, here's my shots, yeah. come freaking get me. Yeah. And when he showed up, he's like, I, I, there's no way I could have heard you. We were way too far away. But mm. I sat there with my back to the lake, with, you know, my hand on this 270, looking out, my bear covered in my piss, you know, about 25 He's yards like, away. He's like, this bear smells like piss. <laughs> yeah. Did you oh. tell him or you were like, I don't know. It's just... well, no, I immediately told the guide. What did he say? He said. You're like, I saw, I heard yeah, Yeti. Yeah, because that guy's probably up there all the time, right? He did not doubt what I saw or heard, rather, mm-hmm. or felt. He, like, no, no, no. Did, he, did See, he embrace it? I totally want to know his reaction it. to you thinking you heard a Yeti and then peeing all over your bear. <laughs> I think I didn't two say separate, anything. Two separate. Because he grabbed the bear <laughs> I was rolling it around, and I'm like, oh, it's covered in piss. He's like, man, this thing really smells. Uh, yeah, it's a gnarly. It was a rut. <laughs> That's a bore. So what do you think? I'm asking you. You hear I mean, story. I don't. Uh, if you tell me. There's not enough evidence. I didn't see anything on DNA. So, so um, one of my buddies, uh, when I was in school, ended up moving to probably Oregon, I guess. Oregon or Washington. for And working for Bigfoot Research Society or whatever it is. And they pay him outrageous amount. They deck him out with like the best car. And he, Taxpayer dollars. He basically hangs, <laughs> you know, 400 trail cameras a year. Yeah. And like, that's what he does. Like his, he's paid to go out and try to find this thing. Now, is he just like a believer? I don't think he actually believes. He just got a job with him. Wow. Like, and it was way better than working for a state agency at so the time. Has he ever found anything? Like, huh? Has he ever found anything? No. No. But I'm asking you, you're, you're a wildlife yep. biologist. Like what would cause that? It's, I mean, what other animal communicates by hitting sticks <laughs> on other things? Or what was that sound that I heard? I'm a forester. I know wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know yeah, trees. Yeah. I'm, you know, I've, I've hunted no, all around the world. I mean, it, that was pretty like intense. In terms of the amount, the frequency, like you hear it once, who knows? Like could have been a beaver tail slap or, or, or something like that. Or no like a, an incredible like woodpecker type thing. But sure. Like, the ivory bill came back. Yes, exactly. But I mean, to have that call and response, 
Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. I mean, listen, there are still some vast amounts of wilderness that exist. Do I think that an ape-like creature could be there? Probably not. But you never know. Mm. Do I think that there's one in in uh, in the United States? No. I think that mm. we are way too covered and and too in tune with even the remote places of Washington or Pennsylvania or Montana, or whatever. Right? It, there's still too much presence there that I think something would happen. You talk about like going up into the Northwest Territory, like in towards the Arctic Circle. Yeah. Who knows? Lots man. of planes to get there. Only planes to get out. Snow machines in the winter. It's really? back to the, you know, if a tree falls and nobody's around, does it really make a noise? You believe, sure. You believe in aliens? No. Big alien guy. You, yeah. Like, again, I'm a believer. I want, yeah. I want, you I want, want that believe. excitement. Well, or alien in, in the terms of like something foreign. Like extraterrestrial. Oh, Tur- do I think like there are. Like there I don't is mean potential. foreign to our country either. I mean, no, no. You mean like, is there potentially a, another solar system that houses something yeah, like Earth? Even let's call it dimensional. Let's even go angelic in terms of dimensions. I don't. I don't think dimensions. Even I do like that think telepathic feeling you get maybe. Well, that's I why do. I'm asking because if he's saying, "Hey, I, I feel a presence," I we don't agree. listen. We I feel d- animals. I don't yeah. believe in a Bigfoot or a Yeti. I do think there's like an electromagnetic type feel between animals between people. Hit me like that so I can see your... Yeah. You want to look into my eyes? Yeah. Okay. L- lower it and raise it. Hold me close while I paint you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do I do think that in terms of like another solar system outside of our galaxy with a model of what we have in our galaxy probably does exist. Yeah. Why not? I, well, that's what I'm saying. I think it Aliens. does. Yeah. I mean, but is it possible to ever know that that would be here i don't think so because it's millions and millions of light years away like how do you get here i kind of like those solar fields that are up there you look at have you ever seen the aurora Mm -hmm. yeah i can't really put that into words Mm -hmm. so just like you can't put into words when you just you can feel somebody standing behind you sneaking up even right now with these headphones yeah wouldn't be able to hear this person you feel that energy and maybe Mm -hmm. being up there that close to the, you know, the far north where you have the aurora and you yeah. have this solar flare and you have mm-hmm. these magnetic fields. Maybe it's enhanced where that's where those animals like to be. I mean, you think about all these animals that migrate and turtles and they go to the same beach or like a salmon. It's like, yeah. how do we explain that? And well, nobody really knows. Yeah. But in reality, it's probably magnetic fields. Yeah, it's not just an imprint on them. It's, it's something likely magnetic fields driving them to certain places to do the same things over and over again. Got to have your hex, hex <laughs> game suit on. <laughs> I got to hang the, uh, the uh, Ozonics. Dude. I mean, it, listen, <laughs> it is an interesting thing because I mean, it, like I've talked to two or three people that are one of them being in, in North Carolina towards the coast in the swamp. I, I did some consulting work for them. And like, if you would talk to, to these two people, 1000%, they would tell you that I'm an idiot because they've seen it Hmm. and they've seen the footprints and they've seen the movement through the swamps and it's thousands and thousands of acres of swamps. Who am I to say that it doesn't exist? And thousands and thousands of years of documented sightings and historical (sighs) things. Mm -hmm. Dude, if there's one thing like we've covered a lot on this podcast, it's uh, like, you know, how many guys in the state of Pennsylvania have, will guarantee you they've seen a 200 inch on their, on their back 40 or, or, yeah. you know, as they're driving around, it's like how many, uh, inaccurate. Oh, it's same with the mountain line. You there, know, how that's many, what I was trying sure. to do. Yeah. Same with the mountain line. Like how many people think that there's a mountain line in the state of Pennsylvania? I, I, and I catch people off guard. I say that there actually is, but it's not from a breeding population. It's because somebody got one as a Has animal and be. let it go. Has mm-hmm. to be there. 100% is like a feral mountain lion running yeah. around. Now so there's probably not, more than one. There's not an existence of a black Panther. Doesn't exist. Oh, I've never even seen one of that. Maybe at the zoo. It would be a jaguar. That would be yeah, that's where genetics and classification come in. Mm-hmm. But I've never seen a bobcat. I mean, I, I'm pretty confident. You've seen a bobcat? That I've probably spent in the more, woods, you mean? More time than anybody. Oh, I've seen know, a bunch of them. Than anybody I really mm-hmm. know or spend much time with as a 32 year old. Mm-hmm. Never seen a bobcat wild in the woods. Because you move around too much. Well, probably. Just, probably. Yeah, you're out yeah. there. With your, with your flask and your <laughs> twitching around, <laughs> yeah. rattling antlers. <laughs> Did you ever hear the story about JP and I rattling, grunting, and snort? We used this buck in. <laughs> she old shaky hands. I got to throw you under the bus. I missed. I was at full drum. So, you know, classic. This is Pennsylvania we, this, or high? This is PA. Yeah. Okay. At my family farm. 
We get up in the spot, <clears> and it's, you know, silent lights just enough, and it's like, I'm going to call. Jared's like, <laughs> Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he has the camera. We've all. I was there. filming you. Yeah, you're filming. Okay. <laughs> and I just like racking these antlers together, and I just let out this crazy snort wheeze. And this buck we call him Big Sides. He just had one big side, and the other side, you know, probably had an injury or whatever. Just comes right in, and Jared left me hanging. I could have made <laughs> so many perfect shots on this deer. And he's nope, not yet, not yet. What? So, and I got the That's not what happened. I was a uh, full draw. Wait, let, let, let Mike tell a story. Let Mike tell a story. But I got the full draw, and I held full draw for like he had us pegged minutes. from like sixty. <laughs> literally, the first thing his deer three minutes. First thing his deer does, he's like sixty yards, and he's like looking right at us. Mm-hmm. And so we're just dead still, and I'm filming him. And then it, slowly, he like our wind's coming this way, so he probably just is is circling us. Two hundred like inch buck. And eventually, <laughs> he kidding. gets to a point. Never did I say no. I'm not on him. That, that didn't happen at all. We pulled the footage. Eventually, footage he got there. to a point where it was like a marginal shot. He was quartering to at like 30 yards. And I was like, I'm on him. And I think you you drew at that point. He's probably already looking at us. And then I think you shot. And the reason you're saying I'm shaky hands is because when you shot, I flinched. There was that. That's what happened. And what, you, so you, you missed him, and I flinched. So we both missed him. But the thing is, normally you get upset, and yeah. we just laughed. <laughs> <laughs> like it's one of those deals. Anymore. Was like, that an Indiana deer? Oh, yeah. yeah. This monster. Yeah. But we just like looked at each other and we looked at the footage and we just laughing. Cause it's like when you put a camera into the mix. Oh, it's a complete it's we did, different. We, different we monster. completely bailed on it this year. We we went we came into the season full force, like, all right, we're gonna videotape, we're gonna make all these different like short feature or full feature films and stuff. And like after like the Dakotas were like, Yeah, this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's just hard. it's just difficult. It's very difficult. But you know? if you're, hunt, you're hunting with a, you know, it's fun and a buddy case. and you whatever, yep. you, it's it, it's more challenging, mm-hmm. obviously, but it makes it that much more hilarious. You seen any grouse in Indiana? Mm. Mm-hmm. I've seen one since December. Oh, well, that makes me want to throw up. That's all those uh, insect issues. Mm-hmm. The old West Nile. Yeah, Jared had West Nile. <laughs> it's called Lyme disease. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, made him a little shaky when he held the camera. Uh, we do got to hunt this spring together. He shaked it. He's shaking it off. It's been too long. I'd be ready for that. I love hunting turkeys more than anything. Hands down. That's why we don't. I'd say more than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're from Ohio. It's different out there. I'm not from Ohio. I'm from Pennsylvania. I'm joking. It's interesting, like because I you, you hunt in Ohio a lot. I like yeah. I like hunting turkeys. I think what spoiled me is when I left Pennsylvania and could hunt. March 15th in Mississippi or even like first part of April in Missouri. Like then now, like by the time I get to May 1st, I'm like freaking late in the season. I want to go catch trout and crappies. Yeah. But it still exists. We still go. The the one okay. thing, I, if you want to go, I do miss here. First in, week. Let's go. When's the first week? Uh, uh, first day is the first Saturday, uh, last Saturday in April. Yeah. It's like the 29th. 29th. That day's book. All right. I was something with my dad first day. But All right. That's first day, but first Monday. Yep. All right. Let's do it. I'm game. We'll film it. All you need is your cell phone. Anymore. You get Better. two tags here? Do you buy the second tag? I usually tap out at one because I like guiding. I like calling for everybody yeah. else. I've, I don't think I've ever killed. One time, I killed two birds in one season. Killed mm-hmm. One with a bow. And and then I well, I shot three one year, one in Nebraska. Yep. What kind of decoy you use in these days? Oh, well, you got to... You gotta use. A you have real a stuff one? Deco- yeah, just an old you shitty hand. decoy. Like I got it back it's from a the taxidermist. It's oh, a no, Jake, it's a right? long beard. It's like a two year old. Yeah, long beard. Yeah. But you ever get a mount back from the taxidermist and you're like, God damn it, this yes, sucks. Often. God, this is the worst <laughs> I've ever seen. Here's the money. So I turned that into a. Uh, a decoy. It's got like the big eyes that just like roll around. Uh, you might as well put googly eyes stuck to it. But yeah, Mr. <clears throat> Yuck sticker for a face. Yeah. But he's awesome. Redhead Fred. <laughs> Redhead Fred's the man. Yeah, that's funny. And, he, and you you don't, you know how people like let oh, yeah? the gobblers come in and feed up their decoy? Mm-hmm. Oh, no, 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 no. You protect Redhead Fred. Kill him before it gets there. Yes. And that kind of takes away from the uh, excitement mm-hmm. of the video, you know, watching him beat the hell out of this that's thing. all right. So what's going on with that? Another whitetail biology question, or not whitetail, <laughs> but wildlife biology question. Mm-hmm. How many times do you ever see a moose or you know, it gets hit, it goes down, the other moose just stands there, or runs away. A buck, another buck runs away. Mm-hmm. 
elk, eh, they kind of, you know, they're yep. the okay. fired up. Fired up. And then same thing with a turkey. How synergistic is the elk and the turkey as far as their hormones and how they. Mm-hmm. So what's going on there whenever you shoot the turkey and the turkey's done? Yep. And all these other turkeys are it's, just. It's in instant pecking order. Pecking order. Instantly. Like, and typically it doesn't matter if you shoot the dominant bird or not in that flock. Like the, the instant mindset of that bird is to make express dominance. Yeah. And that side. And I think it's because it's such a short time frame uh, um, that they've got that that independence of like, I really need to establish myself. Because, I mean, think about right now, you know, we were talking about Ohio earlier. There's flocks all over the place that have five strutters, you know, five long beards in them, mm-hmm. you know. And so all of those birds are kind of like and then you see them side by side. Right. Because nobody really wants to go out in front and the other three just beat the hell out of them. Right. Mm-hmm. They just kind of all want to be in check. But the moment chaos breaks out. Yeah. They're like, okay, now I, now's my chance. Now's my chance to show that I'm the shit. And sh- yeah, and it's the mm-hmm. will to breed. Yep. And I need, this is my opportunity. It's yeah, like the crabs in Nemo. Hey, <laughs> hey, this is our spot. Hey. And you see it in, you see it in whitetails. I mean, I've, humans. I've seen plenty of whitetails when I've shot them, buck goes down, a younger buck will come in and start using his antlers and, you know, like, Go this around. is my chance to, like, push him around a little bit. Interesting. And it's like, you should be scared to death. That deer is bleeding out of its face, mm-hmm. you know, and they just, mentally don't care i don't think they realize i don't think they can recognize no different than right if you away. see a, a one-year-old buck hunt, hump in a mailbox you know yeah, he just doesn't know, know where he's at fired up <laughs> that's how jared and i met at jack's <laughs> a couple of one and a half year old bucks <laughs> i was the buck <laughs> you, <laughs> well you were the mailbox <laughs> uh, i was maybe putting but did i shot i shot a bird in a situation like that one time like they were all getting all fired up and mm. <clears throat> i was bow hunting out of blind with and my dad was there and they just started like, you know, start getting after it, you know, started like squawking and, and yeah. you know, gobbling and uh, they were running all around the blind. And so I came to full draw and they were like, I switched back and forth between windows like five or six times and eventually one yeah. held still long enough for me to shoot it. Well, mm-hmm. it's funny. I mean, whether it's turkeys or even bucks, I mean, the, the fact is like, think about decoys. Like there's certain bucks that will see that decoy and they'll, they'll posture in and ready to hammer it. There's sure. other ones that'll see that thing and they're gone and yeah. they could be like a five-year-old looking at a two-year-old buck and they're like nope i'm not no thanks mm-hmm. and it's just individual behavior you know i see the same thing with with long beards like some will look at my strutter decoy and i mean they're on a mission they're coming and you just just be ready to shoot them in the head because they're not gonna pay attention other ones will see that thing and they're gone mm-hmm. don't even want i don't even seen it that make the, any sense fall yeah which is crazy because that's not the sure. breeding season but you've heard birds gobble in middle, middle oh of yeah them. yeah so, for sure. Yeah, I, I just kind of like, I don't know, when when I'm, you watch the sociology of, you know, animals mm-hmm. in their natural habitat, turkeys, there's nothing more interesting. Well, I think we, we talk about that with deer a lot, and, and we probably need to talk about it more as kind of like the social interactions of the deer. Um, you know, I don't think we pay enough attention to that factor, uh, you know, whether it's late season and there's 30 does and fawns piled into a crop field, like those mature bucks, although they're hungry, they don't want to be around all those other deer. It's yeah. just stressful. I right? it's just like us being in a crowd of people. Like we just, you know, there's just too much going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think as you kind of look at that stuff, that's the, that's the pieces ultimately that you have to kind of process and say, you know, if it's a deer or turkey, you know, there's social aspects of those animals where they want to find another, like during the rut or during, you know, spring mm-hmm. gobbler. There's other assets where that bird kind of just wants to be on his own or that buck just kind of wants to be on his own. And, you know, when you got a ton of other birds and deer, it's not always going to be magic that that one that you're looking for shows. It's like they need like a companion, you know, it's mm-hmm. like bachelor groups That's of it. bucks. And then you see turkeys, you know, right now they're busting up, the, you know, yeah. really starting to. But it's it's really interesting how things group up on that realm. But you never see like two or three big male boar bear. No. And if they find those never. cubs, they're gonna eat never. those cubs. Yeah. But how different is a turkey from a moose or a deer? Yeah, or it's crazy. In, everything's so different. So who got that magical stardust up in the aurora that trickled down on it's them? It's got to be something with the mentality aspect of it. Because you're right, you never see a boar bear with like other. Boar bear. Yeah, just we're just like hanging, hanging out, out on this field. We got these blueberries over here, ladies. No, we'll see you in a couple nothing. weeks. Come over, let them watch. Yeah, nothing, never. <laughs> you know, and and I think that's you know, and then you look at the five year old buck who you run into him in November, and unless he's with a doe, he don't want to be around anyone. And meanwhile, he's hanging out with ten other bucks in yeah. September or August, September, or even like that buck that I was hunting hard this second archery season. The last time I saw him, he was with nine. He was the tenth buck. Nine other bucks. Crazy. 
and he never lifted his head up to look for danger once. That Didn't lead care. buck was doing all the looking. Mm -hmm. And it was so interesting. And as soon as I hit him with the grunt tube roar combo, they all looked at me and they're like, who is this guy? He's nuts. We don't want anything to do with him. Mm -hmm. I'll see you later. You know, we're Gone. going we're going down over here and we're going into this edge of the field. Mm. Take it over here crazy. But you know, yeah. if you did that maybe a couple months before, total yeah. total different, you yeah. know, reaction. Probably would have drew something in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had him come into a call, seven yards. That was Christy. a giant deer, wasn't it? Oh yeah. Christy had him seven yards. Ran underneath, just never stopped, never gave a mm. probably like a 145, 150 inch eight point. Was he bigger than that? 155? 220, 250. He was big. It's a big eight point. On the hoof. Yeah, on the hoof. On the hoof. But no, he's big. I mean, for Western Pennsylvania, I'd yeah, say. Yeah, that was a big deer. It, it, it would have most certainly gone 150. Yeah. Yeah. It's just a big eight point. You need to go find his sheds. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows. <laughs> or, or a Matthews. Yeah. <laughs> One in the same. Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th th especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with the RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a sea four of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and, uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. Did you trout fish this weekend? Oh, yeah. The old annual? Where'd you go? So I was just having a conversation with a guy, um, a client, and he was like, oh, we go up to this place, and it's really quiet. And there's not a lot of fishermen and, okay and i was like oh wow that's this different. sounds great it's a lot different than where i'm at and yeah. it's like here where, where i fish up in millstone township on the oh, first yeah. day every year yeah. it's you got to go hey buddy yeah you know, get a little close to me over here yeah. buckaroo yeah. <laughs> yeah first first three casts you have somebody else crossing your line you know oh yeah <laughs> and you know i went out first morning made that cast at 801 yep that was fun it was mm -hmm. great made some food and hung out and uh you know, we had a great time, but there's a lot of uh, the mupp ears. You know what the yep. mupp ears are? Mm -hmm. You know what a mupp ear is? Mm -mm. They come up here from Pittsburgh and mm. they go and f catch all the trout. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of why I stopped trout fishing, to be honest. Well, too, I mean, too the, many people. The biggest thing has been, and, and I wrote a bitch fest to them, and they didn't really acknowledge me, go figure, but. Um, you know, they've, they've really messed up this whole stocking program, you know, mm -hmm. to where like, even up here at Meadow Run, where I've, I've fished, you know, most of my life, you know, they, they stock for opening day of trout on February 24th. Um, those fish are in the yacht down clear by West Newton by the time opening yeah. day of trout season comes, you know, and, and it used to be week of maybe 10 days before. Right. And even the ones 10 days before, I'd always joke. I'm like, oh, that shit's fished out. You know, <laughs> they, you put them in 10 days early and the locals are getting them all. Was, was that you telling me about the guys not wanting to take fish into holes anymore? They just want to yep. back, back up to spot and dump them 100%, all? 100%. Because they say they don't have volunteers and stuff. Well, they don't communicate the stockings as well as they used to. I'm sure COVID had an influence on that. A too. Huge, huge influence because they started to spread it out and then they started to get less volunteers and then they kind of just adapted that. But it's it's no different. They used to tell you that, hey, we're putting in 500 brook trout and 300 browns in this stream now there's no numbers it just says brooks browns you don't you do don't you, know do you remember what was that 2020 like there was no stocking schedule they like they put fish out but they didn't tell anybody where well they they we were sitting um sitting at work the one day and we all got an email and said uh hey guys officially 8 a.m trout opens and we're like what the fuck mm -hmm. You know, and it was like, we knew you were going to do this piece of shit. Like it was supposed to be Saturday and it's like Monday or something. Oh, yeah. And it was because they wanted to spread out everybody. So no COVID, blah, 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 blah. Wow. And, and you're it, outside, which is like, how do you get, who has got and COVID And it was just fishing? like that. But I mean, it, so I think it was, it was the, it's probably the year before COVID that my dad and I were fishing up here. And like, I mean, it's line, you know, just like you said, shoulder to shoulder, you know, guys, 759, you see some guys flipping in. And, like, it's 10 minutes into the season, and I'm like, Dad, do you see anybody catch anything? He's like, I don't see shit. Like, half hour in? I'm like, what the hell? And then we come to find out that they, hadn't, they had stocked, like, February 15th, and mm -hmm. then the next stocking was the week coming up. And it's like, how are you going to do that for opening day? Like, most of these guys only fish opening weekend. Then they're done, right? S stuff goes back in the closet. <laughs> waiters get dry rotted. You know, you're back in. 
And like, it just, it doesn't make any sense. And so, yeah, they, they use the COVID crutch. Oh, we don't have volunteers. And it's like, you aren't trying, you know, and especially because our license are increasing, you know, we're, we're paying the same amount of money. I understand that you've got fish hatcheries and stuff that are going down, you know, but like just announce it, say, Hey guys, we're going to put a thousand fish in this Creek at this time. Like we just need people there. Mm -hmm. Cool. We'll be there. <laughs> Do you guys have get it or, you know, you in particular questions about deer with, you know, testing positive for the antibodies of COVID. Oh, for sure. And you know, what, what is your general answer? Cause I manage a piece of property and it's township property mm -hmm. and you have your locals that come in and that's all everybody's asking because mm -hmm. you have to think about the people that show up to those sure. events and there's more of a, you know, bottleneck, I, so to speak of, you know, I'm worried and I'm concerned mm -hmm. and they're the ones with the feeders in their backyard and oh, yeah. CWD area. Mm -hmm. So it's great. It's ironic. Yeah. And yeah. what would the answer be? Well, I worked with, uh, I'm not gonna say her name, but, uh, she's our, our area regional director for the Pennsylvania game commission. She's a biologist, great mm -hmm. lady. Mm -hmm. And she's answering all these questions about deer mm -hmm. that have COVID, mm -hmm. which is crazy. I mean, my my answer would be: it, you didn't hear. It. They ended it a couple months ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, they wrapped yeah. it up. They didn't wear their masks. <laughs> it's all done, <laughs> apparently. No, I mean it. It, it yeah. it's been proven that like the animals can obviously get COVID and like have antibodies to be tested for. Mm. I don't think there's any proof or research to show any kind of like negative illness effect so like three years ago could they make that test can't go back up? i mean that's the thing is could have existed 10 years ago mm -hmm. it's it's no different than cwd right before we would uh you know only be able to test a dying a dead deer for cwd how are you going to test a live deer to see if it had cwd uh, you can't pull fluid out and Mm -hmm. Now yeah. you can. There's nasal, new, nasal swab. There's new tests coming out. Well, not nasal swabs, but there are new tests coming oh, out that like you can. Oh, it's like back in the throat. There's yeah. like two holes in mm -hmm. the very back, and you do something yep. like that. But, I mean, and to see how accurate it is. But it's just like anything. You can't, 50, 50. you know, CWD has probably existed in the environment since 1930s or, or before. We just didn't test for it until the 60s, and that was in sheep and mule deer, and then we didn't really pay attention to it in whitetails until the 90s, and now it's a big deal. And it is, it is a big deal because of what could happen, right? We're all proactive in this thing. Um, and that's why people get sensitive. It's the same thing with like a COVID antibody, you know, in a deer is that, you know, you, you're trying to be proactive to a point, but like, is it going to affect, there's no research that shows it, you know? I also have a hard time with game commission and really just seeing it on social media, how we've kind of militarized or how they have militarized the new cadets mm -hmm. working for the game commission. What's the reasoning behind that? I don't know. Um, you know, we had Brian Burhans on the podcast, what, Jared, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And Brian was a good guy. He was real open with it. I gave him a lot of criticism in that I feel like the game, the game commission does a pretty uh, poor job communicating to us, the general mm -hmm. public. It's not like an entitlement. We're the game commission. And that's it. Well, I feel like they're scared, you know, in, in that they're going to be criticized. Of course you are. Like, mm -hmm. it's a passionate sport. It's a passionate thing when you talk about wildlife and, and even on the fish commission, the fishery side. But, like, it only gets worse when you hide behind walls and, like, we can't ask the questions we want to ask. And, yeah, some of them are going to be stupid and we're going to laugh about them. Mm. But there are some valid concerns that, like, we just want to know why. Um, and he admitted that they need to do a better job of getting the biologist out in front there. But right now, there's a there's a wall against the biologist. They they will not put themselves out there for criticism. And I think that's because of the whole Gary Alt stuff, where he was you know threatened to die ten thousand times. And and how easy years. is it to do it on social media? It is. In fact, one of our guys that we had, Chad Stewart, has a whole social media page as Michigan's DNR, deer biologist, deer and elk biologist, and he says whatever he wants on it, you mm -hmm. know, and people will toast him on there, but that's what it's for, you know, and we don't have that pathway. And I think that's why we get, you know, uber critical of the game commission is it's like, I don't know what you guys are doing. Like, all I see is like, hey, the commission accepted these changes and now opening day of rifles on Saturday. And it's like, what? Yeah. Like, why? What are, what are the numbers? Or what did Sunday do? Like, how many more deer did we kill? That's what we asked Brian. Hey, Brian, how many more deer did we kill with these open Sunday opportunities? Mm. And it's like, well, no more. They just spread them out. And it's like, really? Yeah. Interesting. You know? You'd be pleased to know that. So Brian's the director of the, the game commission. He's he's turkey hunter. Oh, not, nice. not, a, not a deer hunter. As is, as is Matt. Marat, 
Yeah, they're turkey hunters. Turkey hunters. Yep. But I mean, they were it. They at least understood why there was some frustration from us. I think the um, and I think Brian, Brian was the one who disagreed with me on having a merged game and fish commission like most states. Mm. Yep. Um, base and he gave some good reasonings around this whole super agency that's run from the legislator down, mm. but from an economical standpoint to your point about the like game wardens or, or, you know, wildlife officers, like we don't have enough wildlife officers to cover that stuff, but there's also fish and boat commission wardens as well. Sure. You put them together and we probably do, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but they're separate. And so they're stretched very thin, very thin. Yeah. You know what I've, I've what else I've been having a lot of fun with this year and past few years is with rattlesnakes. Oh, really? Yeah, you ever mess around with any of those? No, none. Never. I, 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 I don't I've been, say I've mess around. I mean, but you, you get around. You catch them, you tube them? Oh, yeah, catch them, tube them. But I even just, like... What is that, June or July that season opens? Yeah, I think it's, like, the entire month of, like, July and into August. Okay. So... Are you doing it in your area, or are you going north? I don't really actively go out and see... I mean, I've never harvested a rattlesnake. I probably never will unless I'm, like, you know, I really want to, mm -hmm. you know... I watch make, those, make uh, the old Leatherwood guys. Those go guys are great. It. Yeah. Oh, my dad, he has his glasses down. His sound <laughs> I'm like, what are you watching? I'm watching these border collies wrangle up all these cows out in Montana. And I'll be like, what are you watching? Leatherwood boys. The Leatherwood boys. They're out huh? here hunting rattlesnakes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, cool. Pen game, Penn's game starts in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, Dad. I think cool. they're from Clarion. Yeah. Yeah, they're North North PA. Yep. But it's really, really interesting to see the rattlesnake. Yeah, and it's natural. It's kind of like a slug. Yeah. You know, it's just kind of going along, doing its thing. But you know, I've encountered them several times. I've encountered two really big timbers. One, I was working on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia. And we, like, the whole time I'd been wearing, like, snake boots, right? And we're, we're like, towards the end of our, our like, four-week summer work shift. And, like, uh, the one guy was like, yeah, he's like, I never, like, there's no rattlesnakes around here. He's like, you have to watch copperheads a little bit. We were marking trees and stuff. Mm. He's like, but just, like, we never see rattlesnakes. And I was like, oh, cool. Like, I can finally take, the, like, I was sweating like crazy, right? I can wear yeah. my shoes and stuff. And it's, like, literally the next day, I'm, like, in there, and I'm working on something. And then, I'm like, oh, yeah. holy shit. And there's just a giant timber, like, right next to my, like, had he not eaten, he probably would have bit me. Yeah. And it's like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> that, that's another animal like the bobcat. I never saw yeah. growing up until you get into those areas. You know what I never saw growing up? Ticks. Yeah. Never saw, like, all the turkey hunting, everything that I did. Never had a tick on me until never. 10 years ago. I know. How is that possible? Hmm. Like, I mean, I'm talking. Invasive plants, deer density. I mean, I remember, like, I was probably... 17, 18, we were coming, we were hunting in Indiana County and a bunch of old strip mines. Mm -hmm. I remember driving home and I was like, what the fuck's in my lake? And I was like, holy shit, dad, look, a big ass deer tick. And it was like a thing, like, holy shit. Now it's like loaded. What about coyotes growing up? I never saw a coyote growing no. up. So is there kind of some kind of parasitic synergy with human expansion and ticks and invasive plant species? I've seen more red fox and gray fox in a long time. Me too. You know, and I, and I mean, trapping obviously has faded out, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. You know, people true. just don't trap and, and don't accept trapping as like, as, you know, a good form of control. The general public just doesn't like it. You ever hunt coyotes with a dog? No, I have not. Oh, it's intense. Yeah. It's you, almost like I don't really want to do it. You cover some property, right? Yeah. I mean, you're watching the hunt. On, on the... GPS a, thing. A GPS or a screen. Some guys have, I mean, they're decked out. I mean, they have yeah. big 20 inch LCDs in their truck and you're driving and each dog has a name and a collar. And then you'll look out the window and be like, okay, here we go. And you'll hear it comes. And then you'll look out the window and here comes the coyote. And then here's these dogs, dogs right on. And it. then the coyote runs into a blowdown and then it's just an all out fight. And then when they're fighting, they kind of bay them up and you have to run in, usually in the snow, and get in. And then you have to shoot through these dogs' heads. Jesus. And like the last time I was, was on a on a property one of my clients and we were in there hunting and the dogs you know they're mm -hmm. you know barking in this coyote i mean it's grrr, you know it's f trying to fight and defend itself backed into the spot and you have to like almost hold your gun out mm -hmm. and like get it real close to shoot or else you might hit one of the dogs but That's it's crazy, really man. intense and i mean i like hunting bears with dogs because they tree the bear mm -hmm. mountain lions yep, same thing tree. bobcats but with the dogs, it's ground level. It's where I would consider it 
um, up for discussion as far as, you know, where I stand ethically, but is it a great tool? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, to utilize and, and hunting with any dog is awesome. I've been on one hog hunt with dogs and it was intense Yeah, to like bay, like a big boar. And you see how these dogs, you know, you've got like kind of the, the rat pack chasing and, and cornering, and then you've got the bay dogs. Oh yeah. And I mean, they're like armor. Yeah. Mm. And it's wild. And that pig is mean. You'd be a, you'd be a bay dog, Jared. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And then I just watched a guy with a, a freaking big Bowie knife just walk up and snap it right in the side and fall over. Yeah, that would be better because you can actually <laughs> maneuver it away from the dog yeah. and give that quick, more yep. ethical. Yep. See you later. Perfect. You know. Gone. Interesting, though. That's in the south where they still run deer with dogs. I've had. Shoot them with buckshot. Yeah. It seems like the biggest issue people have with that kind of hunting is just the trespassing that happens. They're like, yeah. Good point. They're like, oh, your dogs are all over my property. They're like, well, we're mm. we're not trespassing. They just made a they just did a big run up on the mountain in um, February. Stanger and those guys went up through Scott's property and stuff, and we're just like, yeah, you know, have at it, roll, go yeah. go, do what you gotta do. And I mean, they covered miles. Oh yeah, yeah. Some dogs yeah. Will go forty miles. That's crazy in a yeah. day. Yeah, I mean, on wild. the GPS tracker, you can literally see how their track and how far they've gone and. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, the, some of those, and I mean, those guys are hardcore at it too, because mm -hmm. they wait as soon. I think as soon as deer season's over, rifle season's over, they're gone on it. Hmm. You ever hunt coy uh, coyotes on a snowmobile? No, have you? Yeah, yeah. You got a story to go along with that? Oh, uh, well, kinda. Uh, mine's not as good as the guys that actually that do it and that live out there. And you need a lot of country to to do it. Um, but so this is Montana. I've got I've got some buddies that are like in this ring of things. <clears throat> they don't shoot them. They don't call them in and shoot them right. It's just so flat out there. They just run them over. <laughs> yeah, they they see they'll see coyotes like a mile out, and they, they'll do they do it like a a journey. Yeah, you know, there's like uh whatever, ten or fifteen guys. They'll jump on their snowmobiles and they'll ride from, you know, whatever Billings, Montana to Big Sandy or wherever they're going, and they're just crossing crossing country and they'll come up on coyotes, you know, and then they'll just rip out off after them. You ever ride a snowmobile? I've never ridden one. Nope. They go like 90, 100 miles an hour. Oh, yeah. Yeah, easy. And it's so flat out there, they just, they just run them over. <laughs> I've, run seen them over. That, I've seen that up in, like, Minnesota, up on Lake of the Woods with wolves. Yeah. Is they'll tell me the same thing. They'll get a wolf that'll go out on the lake when they're on snowmobiles, and they'll just yeah torch it. They'll go a wow. couple, couple hundred miles over a few days, and they'll kill 50, 60 coyotes. Jeez. It's crazy. Yeah. I don't like hunting coyotes, but, you know, at the same time, they're cool to see, and mm -hmm. they really suck when there's a lot of them. Yeah, <sighs> dude, I always see coyotes when I'm like, and I know before I go, I'm like, I should take a, I should take a gun. I'm gonna see a coyote. Well, when and then I see a coyote, when you I, say it's thick, like <clears throat> obviously being out west and even in Kansas, like there's a lot of coyotes in Kansas. I mean, when those things sound off, like in the middle of the night, or when you're climbing out of your your stand, I mean, it'll run chills up the spine because you're like, damn, like that's close. Oh yeah, dogs don't scare me. A lot, of, a lot of people are scared of dogs. You know what else doesn't scare this guy? I, I'll fight any bulls. <laughs> yeah. You ever see him around cows? Lets him out? <laughs> I respect bulls. I'll give, I'll give bulls their space at least. See, is there more than one story about you letting stuff out? Because I've never told a soul about Doing what? One. He, he let he let him out in Illinois. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I I've, told that, yeah okay. I've told the story. So he knows that story, too. I've never told a soul. Yeah. <laughs> Appreciate like, it. Oh, can I tell it now? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I've told him. Just, I forgot to close the gate. And landowner got so mad at me, and he kicked me. He Is that the me Illinois one? Back. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I did. I I'm a I remember you calling me because we were talking through it. You're like, you were you were first of all, you were down in the dumps because you're like, geez, like I came out here with like such high hopes. It was like, a crappy hunt. I haven't seen anything. Game. Yeah. You were pretty upset. You called me and you're like, oh, I yeah. just can't believe it, and like you were sad about the hunt too. But then there's nothing worse than leaving a gate open uh, on a landowner's uh, property. Yeah. Well, it was just like the. The end of the trip, it was already a, a sucky hunt. And it <laughs> was like, what? the cows got let out. <clears throat> I can't think of a worse way to end it. Like, I was getting ready to just, like, slump myself back to the truck and, you know, drive home anyways. You know, and I could have done without letting all the farmer cows out. <laughs> 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 you know. It's like, let me just leave on my own accord rather than. Have you guys uh, ever had a good hunting, like, deer hunting experience around cows? Uh, no. Not that I, can I feel recall. like when the cows start to move in on me, like the only good it's over. that's come from huh. like cows being involved in a situation is like because I, I can access through a pasture where there are cows because mm -hmm. the deer aren't there. Mm -hmm. 
I remember for years and years and years, my dad, like growing up, my dad was always like, I'm dear, I'm dear they don't care about cows at all. You know, <laughs> no impact whatsoever. And I just, I was like, I don't know, man. And then over time, eventually I was like, yeah, no, it's, they, mm. they don't, they don't, it's not that they don't like cows, but there's nothing there for them. There's the nothing pasture. there. Huh. Yeah. They've, they've mowed it down. Maybe they've case. associated cows with people. You know what made me, I think, immune to like cows and walking through cows is, for, you know, I grew up hunting at the cow farm, you know, in, in Ohio. Oh, and, yeah. And we used to walk from the Roberts house all the way back to the lake where we would duck and goose hunt. Yeah. And that whole pasture is full of cows, hundreds of, you know, uh, Angus. And it was pitch dark. We would walk through there at like four in the morning. And they would just be circling us and oh, there us are all the people that are like, oh, yeah. like scared of them. Like, yeah, hey, cow, go! And yeah, it's just yeah. like, just, just keep moving. Well, they don't bother me at that's all. That's what happened. We were hanging stands in this. It's I don't even know near your uncle's property or something. And all these young steers, I mean, like a year or two old, all came and like surrounded the machine. Yep. And the ranger, I'm in the ranger. I'm yelling at Jared, and he's up in the tree. Mike's like, ah, yeah. ah, ah. <laughs> like I didn't grow up with cows. I didn't know. These are giant Brangus bulls or whatever. And I mean, I'm like, Jared, look, you got to get down. And he's like, oh, I hate these freaking cows. And he like climbs down in the middle of them. And is like, ah, like, get it. Like there were a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, there was more than twenty. Well, that's it. They're, you're like a magnet. The moment they see you, they're like, ooh, let me yeah, go see what these guys are doing. Out. I was turkey hunting one time in Indiana County, just near the Homer City Power Plant. And I'm walking into my spot where I had these birds roosting. It's pitch dark. You know what I mean? So I'm walking in. I'm walking on this old gas well road. And I look. And I was like, oh, shit. And I put, you know, three, three and a half inches in there. And I'm ready to go. And I'm like, you know, back bear. Hey, bear. And then it gets closer. I'm like, that's a 2,000-pound <laughs> cow. And these cows got loose. Somebody yeah. must have left the gate open. And they just came right up to me. And I'm screaming and yelling. I'm going to shot this damn cow. <laughs> I mean, I was like this, a limousine, Langus. I mean, it's huge. It was just this gigantic thing. And here the, the landowner got a hold of me and was just like, yeah, I wish you would have shot those, you know, because if they run on the highway, you know, oh, my insurance yeah. doesn't cover me. Dude, I had that not too long ago. I was on 43 on the Turnpike Bypass here. It was probably a year ago. It's late, like real fucking late. It's like 2 a.m. I'm coming back from like a long drive somewhere. I don't know where we were. And like I come through the tool and like I'm, I'm you know, I'm blazing pretty good. All of a sudden, I'm like, what the fuck? And I mean, I cut it quick, and it's two cows running straight oh up God. the highway at me. I mean, dude, if I would have hit them at, like, oh, 70, it would have exploded my vehicle. Yeah, from burgers. I mean, it was, I was just like, and so I call the, you know, and now I feel like the idiot. So I call 911. It reroutes me to the Turnpike Commission. And I'm like, hey, I'm on 43. There's two cows running, like, straight up the high. And they're like, excuse me, sir? You know, because it's like 2 a.m. They probably are like, yeah, this guy's loaded. Yeah. I'm like, no, seriously. Like, I almost hit him with my truck. Like, if somebody hits these things, it's going to kill them. Like, mm -hmm. if they hit him with a car, they're dead. And she's like, uh, did you say cows are running on the highway? I was like, yes. Like, they got out on the highway. So I called Grote. And I was like, dude, I, I was like, this person's not listening to me. I said, you're a cattle farmer. There are cows on the freaking highway. Somebody's going to hit them and you die. Called him at 2 in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, he was, all, he was working. Because I texted him, I think, first. Yeah. And he was like, he's like, yeah, man. He's like, I think I know whose guys, whose cows those are. I think I would have cut a backstrap out for sure. Yeah. I mean, I probably would have cut one out just as it blew right over through my windshield. Have you ever taken any roadkill home to eat? <laughs> I ate, that's the first time I ate Bobcat. Joe Hamilton from really? QDMA. Uh, we were at, we were in South Carolina. Or no, we were in Mississippi. We were at Bronson's house. We are at Bronson's house drinking, just like having a barbecue. Joe Hamilton's there. Brian might have been there as well. And it's like me and Emily Bronson and we're hanging out and Joe's like, Hey, I'm, uh, I'm cooking some Bobcat backstrap. Would you be interested? I'm like, yes. Like, obviously for sure. Like Joe Hamilton is going to make me Bobcat. Yes. Sure. Yeah. And so like, you know, we eat it and we're like, Oh, this is good. I was like, Joe, where'd you find these? He's like, well, it was a roadkill, you know, right down the road, like real fresh. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> interesting. Mm. <laughs> we, interesting. Had a guy, we had a guy at work. Kevin, shout out to Kevin Fatula. And he would hear about, or someone would say a deer got hit, or he would know where one was. He yeah. would leave to go get it. 100%, man. And he was like, oh, that's fresh. And like, I'd show up to work. He'd be like, got a deer this morning. I'm like, oh, cool. Where'd you get it? Oh, 422. <laughs> and I'm like, we're out off 422. And I knew, I'm like, roadkill? Yeah, that coal truck got it right in the head. All the meat's good. <laughs> one of the only ones I ever picked up, I lived in Missouri. We were renting, so we probably had only been there a year. And I was. I don't know what I was doing. I was driving into town or no, Emily was, Emily was driving into work to the department of conservation. She said, Hey, there's a buck hit on the road right up from the house and it's still alive. And it's like October, November. Mm. 
And so, like, I'm, before she even said, I'm, like, in the truck and drive up. And there's a nice 10 point. And so I'm, like, and it's, like, it's still pretty alive, but it's not going anywhere. So I'm trying to drag this thing. Like, there's cars beeping oh, at me. Shit. I'm trying to drag it. And I'm it's trying like to help. And, you know. <laughs> what and are you so, doing? I'm burying I'm you. And so finally, like, the cop shows up, right, and takes out a shotgun and, like, shoots it right in the head. And he's, like, you want it? I was, like. Yeah, he's you like he's like take it, and I was like, okay. Isn't there kind of a controversy between the game commission yeah, and state so, police officers? So the states, so he was like, you know, take it. Well, meanwhile, I need a carcass tag, right, to to actually possess, possess that. Yeah. So my wife works for the Department of Conservation, so I'm like, well, yeah, I need a carcass tag. He's looking at me like, I don't care, like go f yourself, like get this thing out of the Later, road, buddy. I'm going back to the station yeah. to tell my buddies. <laughs> I just go to a game two with the Mossberg pump. Can you take a picture? Game with over, me? baby. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, so I load this thing in the truck. So now I've got this untagged shot buck in my vehicle. And I'm like, I got to go. So I call Emily. I said, hey, I'm coming to your work. She's like, why? I was like, I picked up that buck, the cop shot. She's like, you don't even have a tag on it. I was like, well, that's why I'm coming to your work for yeah. this thing. Hook me up. Just print one out. Yeah. You know? So we get babe, there. Give me a carcass tag. We hey, get there. The like warden guy comes out. He's like, all right. And he fills out a tag and then went home and cut her up in the garage. You know? Yeah. A little bit tenderized. Yeah, you know, dude, in Alaska, they have a, a wait list like hundreds of people deep for hit moose. Sure. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that's what they do. Yeah. Every single one, the state, it's like standard procedure. You know, speaking, hit a moose, call the people. You know? Speaking of Alaska, we talk Pacific Northwest. One thing I was talking about, John, is they're doing the um, the salmon runs out there now. Yeah. And so King Salmon and stuff. And he's like, you know, because like I, I like salmon. I know you do too. He's like, had salmon for lunch. It's in unreal though. Like, yeah, store bought salmon. He's like, but I'm talking like, so they cut these big fillets out, and the guy's like, take your, um, take your whole king salmon back, right? Put it on. He's got a Traeger. Put it on your Traeger. Just let it cook real slow. And he said, when it comes out, just peel it out like almost like a pulled pork, basically. Ooh. And he's like, he's like, man, I got like 22 extra pounds just by pulling it off the bones and and out of the cheek meats and all that. Oh, and he's like, it looks like a giant thing of pulled pork. And he's like, I made salmon burgers the other day. So oh. just like blow your mind. And he's like, because there's so much like just rich oils and all of these things. And that's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. And you don't want it to drip away. And, oh, dude, when crazy. I was <clears throat> when I did that internship in Alaska, um, you can't actually fish the Yukon River because it's too silty. Like the fish can't see anything, so you can, really, yeah, they don't fish. Uh, what they do is they use uh, fish wheels, and they're they're big. Gut. You ever seen these? Mm -mm. Heard of these? I was no? thinking you were gonna say snag hooks or something. I was thinking in like a no. net. Yeah, yeah, they they use the uh, gill net fish wheels, and so it, it's a big like uh, it's a wheel, like you mm -hmm. would see like a a turbine, like you know. So like what they had in like the old days to like power things and yeah. using the, the grist cottages. mills. That's what the it looks like. Mill. Yeah. That's what it looks like. Maybe a little smaller. They're they're okay. you know maybe about the size of this. Just sitting off the bank, Miss Honey's house from <laughs> yeah. <Tilda. laughs> well, so so they they build it onto like kind of a, a frame. So they, yeah. there's like a flat dock okay. that sits on top of the water, and then there's the wheel that uh -huh. spins, uh -huh. and there's a box. And some of the fancy ones have like a, a live well type of deal on it. Yeah, and they'll pull it out to like where the the current is is at or whatever, like on the on the side of the river. Yeah. And they'll just let it spin. So the water is spinning every yep. day. And as the, the salmon are swimming upstream, it catches them and it flips them over. And it drops they go them, up into the wheel? Drops them in the the, the bucket. And Very so, interesting. So, yeah, you go check it like once a day and it's like, hey. It's, it's cool. kind of like a fish ladder, but different. Yeah. There's like five five salmon in here, you know? Those wow. fish ladders are weird. <laughs> and so we'd they get are, them. Man. And I was checking them with one of the, the locals. Like a, he's an Athabascan is what they are mm -hmm. up there. We would take the boat out. We would check it. We'd bring them back. And he had a big, you know fish house where he was you know smoking all the, mm -hmm. the salmon and so he would cut them up and he would uh smoke them right there and we ate them in camp that's really cool it was pretty awesome you know one of the best places that i ever fished was illegally um in an amusement park that's <laughs> in this general vicinity of where we live um <laughs> and i jumped the fence to go in and i caught some of the biggest fish i've ever caught in my life i've seen those fish you're talking about uh, <laughs> trout. i know what you're talking about uh i caught some trout in there um uh, mostly giant bass like mega large mouths underwater slides. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Like, <laughs> oh, I got a giant. Well, like, some kids like, like under, under like giants. No, you got to go in. Um, so I used to fish. Uh, okay. So this part, amusement park, Lowell Hannah, right? Yeah. So I'm always, I'm a big believer of the, if I'm in the stream, I'm not trespassing type of guy. Sure. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so I work up. That's the law. Yeah. So I work up Lowell Hannah, right? Past four right mile, away. I'm up in there, and I mean, I, I'm pounding trout. You know, caught a couple of tiger trout up in there and stuff. That's cool. And then the park employees, because everybody's up on the bridge, right, watching me fish. Park employees come and say, "Hey, you can't fish here." What do you mean I can't fish here? 
you can't fish here. It's private property. I'm like, I'm in, I'm in Little Hannah. I'm yeah, like, I'm in Pennsylvania. The stream. Yeah, I'm in the stream. Like, I'm not trespassing. Well, no, you're not allowed. I was like, well, what do you want me to do? Bypass to like be at your park and fish here? And they're like, well, no, you just can't fish here. And I'm like, yes, I can. Like, you call the cops. Like, ask the cops. So they did. And then the cops obviously don't know what's going on. They're like, yeah, you're trespassing. Hey, are you the guy that I showed that deer to? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not trespassing. Like, I'm in, I, I started down there. I worked the stream the whole way up. Like, you guys don't own this section of stream. It's not yours. And uh, I also wrote the fish commission on that. They never wrote me back either. They kick you off. They did. Eventually I left because they said they were going to arrest me. So. But you were hammering them. I was crushing them in there. Yeah, because obviously like nobody or ever fishes. Or steel or? Both. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Now, when I was now, what we in do, the park, then I, I was potentially trespassing. Well, but pick, it was You pick a night, you, me, and JP. The amusement park was closed Young at that Jamie point. here. We'll, we'll all go out, and we'll do a little trespassing. Mm-hmm. We've been there. I don't know sounds like it's not old. even trespassing. It's not trespassing. It sounds like, hey, they're being American. Yeah, in hindsight, were you, you were in the right. Um, it, it's, uh, it's one of those laws of like how much land under the water do those places own? Um, technically I think if I'm standing in the water and making contact with the ground, I probably am trespassing. But if I'm floating, like if I'm in a kayak or anything, I'm not, but I don't understand that necessarily. Well, I was told, and cause we own a, a my family owns a piece of property and it's, you know, Pretty active. It's not heavily stocked, but it's active. People canoe mm-hmm. and kayak down it, and they mm-hmm. fish up and down through it and everything. But if you're off the shore to where it would be, to where you could make a cast or fish from, then you're considered trespassing. So it's kind of like a best judgment thing is what I was told. Subjective. Yeah, so it's quite, sub- you know, so what are you going to say if you're the yeah, I don't know. Landowner? I don't know what, what the law actually is. <clears throat> I thought at one point, there are certain states where if you're in the water, it's fair game. Mm-hmm. Like if you're standing in the water, if you never come up on the bank, they can't say anything to you. That's mm-hmm. public property. It's almost like a right away, basically. There's other places that they own the water underneath the river. So if you're standing and waiting, you're trespassing. But if you're floating, you're not. In Pennsylvania? Yes. Huh. But I don't know what the actual law is. Just going there. on gut here. It seems like if you own the land, you should own the, the water. Can. <clears throat> that's like a Montana. And, I mean, I watch Yellowstone. At least that was the rule mm-hmm. on Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. You said you can't? Well, I mean, especially when it's a, they stock it as a public fishery. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but you're not asking for that. Hmm? You're not asking for that. What do you mean? You know. You're the landowner. You're not asking for them to stock publicly funded fish. Yeah, I don't need your fish. No, I'll but I mean, fish. yeah, I, I think it's... I think it comes down to the navigable waterways piece. Like if yeah. it's a non-navigable waterway, then it is privately held. Oh, well, that's what that's I'm saying. That's 100% percent what it yep. is. But if it's a navigable waterway, which oh. I would assume Lohanna is probably, then yeah, that's different. Then it, I think you're if you're in the water, even if you're waiting, it's not trespassing. Is this uh, amusement park? That's a navigable waterway. Uh, there's a bridge that connects it. It's Idaho Park. I know. I know. <laughs> well, I think we're all clear. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, but you're saying that's a, uh, if it was navigable, mm-hmm. then it would be public. Yeah. The water, the, the creek that separates like through their property would be public. Oh, I see. And I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's no different than like, if you've got the yacht, which is right up here, if the yacht flows through your property, I fish you can't say dinner. like, Oh, you know, there goes a guy on a drift boat. Like he's trespassing. Can't do that. Yeah. Mm. I fished there before too. I'm pretty sure. In Little Hannah at, at yeah. the Ottawa. Yeah. yeah. We almost bought property right across the road from there. The there ac- you know, the yep. access to Ottawa. There's a long driveway. Yep. Goes way up in there. My, my parents. It used to be there. my stomping grounds up through there to Lynn run up by the old melon property. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah your parents would have had some trespasser issues. Probably, mm-hmm. yeah, apparently. <laughs> yeah, uh, we would have met a lot sooner. <laughs> it's my damn rights. <laughs> I trout fishing, man. I, my dad and I used come to come and get me, Dwayne. We used to go. <laughs> we used to go every opening day, and I just remember hating seeing people. Like I just say, same day. as hunting. It's just like I just don't want to see. It's people. a weird thing, man, because there there are certain things I love. That's what I love about Pennsylvania tradition. Even opening day at gun season, like you know. It's just like I'm a little kid on Christmas. Like I still, even if I know that I'm not hunting or I'm tagged out or whatever, like I still wake up. I'm like, man, it's opening day, you know. And, yeah. And same thing with trout. Like, you know, I was uh, we were turkey hunting in Kentucky this year, but typically, you know, 
seven fifty nine. I'm like, all right, boys, let's let's throw them in, you know. And it's just it's just those kind of traditions and that nostalgia you try to hang on to. But you know, I I do love fishing like now because those waterways have cleared out of so many people, and they usually are doing supplemental stockings at this point. Well, um, <laughs> dude, I'm looking forward to. I'll probably make it out in Pennsylvania once or twice, but um that elk hunt that we're doing mm -hmm. um in colorado it's i mean it's obviously remote there's no fishing sure. there's no fishing pressure out there it's not stocked either no but it's but, all wild yeah there's a lot of uh cutthroat trout and there's mm -hmm. a really nice stream that runs down through there that's what you want and uh i'm looking forward to that the yeah. the last time that we went <laughs> my dad shot his bull the first day and i shot mine the second mm -hmm. and then we fished cutthroat for damn for five days you cor you a corn and worm on a bobber kind of guy or uh <laughs> <laughs> I used to be. I forget what, what are we you had. catching carp? Power bait. <laughs> I actually kind of forget. What I think we had a fly rod. I was I'll probably. That's, I'll that's take a piece. I'll take a fly rod with me this mm -hmm. year. In fact, I might even buy a fly rod for that trip. I don't I think I go to Cabela's. Get a takedown rod. Five weight takedown rod. Five or six piece. That way you can pack it down it's in. Just this big. Okay. And you put it right in your. I, I mine's in the back of my truck. I bring it with me everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe I'll get something like that. I'm old. good on flies. I have a bunch of flies and stuff. But I used like my grandpa's old fly rod for a long, long time, and eventually I think it broke or something. But you mm -hmm. broke it or my wife turned it into a decorative GP, piece in the house yeah yeah it's um yeah i mean well right now we're fortunate this year last year we had a lot of low water conditions and trout season and right now we've got a pretty good water flow going i heard up north it's is it pretty low up there mm, i'd say right now it's about average we just had some rain but i mm -hmm. think we didn't have too too much snow Man, I missed, uh, I, I told myself I was going to go up and catch steelhead off of Erie this year, and I just never freaking pulled the trigger. Yeah, that's <laughs> Told fun. yourself that? I, I was like, I, I was adamant that I was just going to take a day and just go up and fish, you know, walnut and elk and catch some steelhead and just, mm -hmm. just be up there during the week. And it's just, I do it every year, even in the fall. And then I'm like, yeah, just never make it. Stop into poor Richards. That's it. Yep. And yeah, I just never make, make it. to Kansas either. That's I know. Two. Life's too short. Start making a point of these things. I know, dude. Yeah, we must got to quit adding jobs to the plate. <laughs> I know we need less careers. Like Jerry was saying, like it is way cooler backpacking or hiking in yeah. to a remote stream in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. They're everywhere. Yeah, literally every seep and crack in a mountain mm -hmm. has wild trout. In Pennsylvania, for the most part, which is really cool. And they're not that big, but damn, are they pretty? Yeah, and they fight and they'll hit and you mm -hmm. you know. And, and that's it. I mean, go up into Potter and Elk County and you see you know. those people. Yeah, you know, just, the typical mup beers, you know, mm -hmm. littering the bush lights. Nothing None. against bush light, but mm -hmm. mup beers. Yeah. Mup beers. Picking up the old eagle claw packs all over the place. Oh, eagle claws, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody that I, everybody asked me anything, like, where are we catching those fish? Nice Marionville. <laughs> <laughs> We're at Marionville. Where'd you get that buck? Marionville. Oh uh, yeah. Up yep. there, Greg Hill Road. Yeah, there you go. That's the uh mm. the, the, the spot to the plant. Yeah, it's uh I don't know. I mean, we were talking about, we've talked about it a lot this year. You know, I think I've seen more people in places in the last two years than I've seen in a decade of hunting and fishing. Like just seems like everywhere just has like mounds of people, um, you know, and it's That's good. The PA game, the sport, game and fish would say, we're doing a good job. Yeah. yeah it, well, it's opportunistic, you know, you know, you look opportunities. At, yeah. You kind of looked like not many people like growing up, you asked your standard American man mm -hmm. after the war, you know, that was our grandfathers or whatever, you know, what are you into? And it's hunting, hunting and fishing, fishing. Yep. and either working in the mine. And yep. now there's just so much different stuff out there. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people just aren't as interested. And I'm kind of turning like a new leaf, I guess. I don't, but I, like, just like what you mentioned with, you know, 758, like, let's go, you get excited. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I like being camp bitch. First day of deer season, I sure. don't want to see. I just want to make everybody food. Yeah, I just want to get everybody going and bring hear up. that first gunshot and just be like, Oh, oh yeah, yep. what was that? Mm -hmm. Mumas over the hill, they mm -hmm. got one. Yeah, but I just love that whole like, like camaraderie. Everybody's hanging out and everybody's having yep. fun. But now you're gonna need to rely on me because I'm bringing you your sandwich. Yeah, and I'm bringing you the split pea and ham soup and the pressure cooker. Well, we talked about that. I, I think that you know. I would say at least in the last 10 years, maybe more that's faded. And I think we'll see a resurgence in that from maybe our generation and that, you know, as we start to have kids and things like that, it's like, I mean, some of my best like childhood memories were going to deer camp for five days. Like I remember the day I left deer camp, I was looking forward to deer camp the next year. Oh yeah. 
you know, and that just, it, and I think that it kind of faded out there for a while. And I think you'll start to see that brought back in that, you know, even, you know, take it as a benefit from COVID. It's like, listen, we don't need to be around all these people all the freaking time. We can survive by like just doing our own thing, you know, and being in the woods and being outdoors. And so I think you'll start to see that kind of, you know, pick back up. And, and just like every camp, you have guys who hunt opening day and that's it. They, don't, they won't hunt anything else ever again, you know, until the next year. But then you'll have a bunch of guys that are hardcore like us that are like, you know, we want to, we will take the extra effort to form a camp and make sure it happens just to have that camaraderie aspect again. Mm -hmm. And a lot um, of those guys weren't even, I mean, I would say probably less than half, but that's a good bit of those guys that come in from out of town mm -hmm. and they come in, they stay for two or three days. Show up. Yep. They go to camp, you know, they do their thing. Mm -hmm. And if they shoot a buck, odds are those guys aren't icing it, get it frozen, process it and shipped it back to whatever no. they come up just to be a part of it. Yep. And that's where it's nice to be a camp bitch yep. and be like, Hey, I could still come out and drag deer, gut, hang out, you know, mm -hmm. do the whole thing, get the full experience. And there's something, I don't know if social media or what, but it's like, you have to, if, if, if you don't have a picture of it and you didn't post about it, were you actually yeah, there? Did, did you actually it didn't do exist. it? So that's like a big thing. Yeah. And yeah, it kind of has also maybe shape shifted what we're used to because growing up we didn't have that we're like the last generation sure you know you're at the very young i'd say i'm in the middle and i'd say yeah, like, i mean facebook came out my freshman year in college the hunter podcast is brought to you by stealth cam dude where would we be without our cell cams i would definitely be divorced at this point <laughs> yeah i hear that i mean the fact is is i spent more time checking cameras than i actually did hunting prior to cell cameras now at least my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home, buried in my phone checking those pictures. Yeah, 100%. And dude, when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras, reliability is I think the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras and ultimately that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. Southcam.com, check them out. For everyone listening, use the code HUNTER20 at checkout and receive 20% off any of your Stealth Cam products. We had AOL growing up. <clears throat> yep. Oh, Bing. yeah. Yeah, Instant Messenger, baby. Oh, yeah. What was your name? That's how I was getting all my chicks. Uh, Lil Flinner. <laughs> Lil Flinner. <laughs> no, no, of your social media account. <laughs> Yeah, I like to X, just, X, I, X, Lil Flynn. I like to just break <laughs> through, Flynn. break through all the transparency and just let them know. What, what was yours, JP? With. My what? Your AOL name. I didn't have one. You didn't have an instant messenger what? name? No way. Well, no, no way. So message? it collapsed right after mm, Mike's generation. I might have had one briefly, but then I think it quickly got overtaken. It was probably like JP Snapback thirteen or something. <laughs> He's yeah. laughing at little, little Flynn. Yeah. <laughs> the only reason I remember that is because that's somehow my eBay username. Too, yeah. Which I would have created good. around the same time. Yeah, because I mean, that, so. <laughs> I yeah, was into snapbacks at the time. Because <laughs> Instant Messenger was a big deal when I was in probably high school. Maybe yeah. middle school, but definitely high school. Like that oh, was yeah. that was how I communicated so you get with on the chicks. Seven, after dinner. I still had a fucking basketball phone. Like it was a, a full basketball that I talked to. <laughs> 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 yeah, it would ring. Hello? It would ring and it had like Michael Jordan on the side or something, you know? Um, oh, that is cool. Back when you had posters oh, on the yeah. wall. I had like Marine Corps. I, yeah. <laughs> I did pull ups at the fair. Like, yeah. you know, I, I had one of those yeah. t shirts too. I did twenty two pull ups. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Steel City Race, so exactly. I did T-shirt. Yager Yager. Oh, that's uh, so I, funny. I Yags. <laughs> yeah, all my communications before text message with girls were instant messenger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Snowboarder. You Check. would sit there for hours waiting for the girl to, like, come online. You're like, God damn it. She's been away for fucking four hours. Is she ever? <laughs> she's back. <laughs> <laughs> Door opens up. Yeah. Doo -doo. Doo -doo. No, she's in there. <laughs> and then you get a message. <laughs> you try to get it on there so quick and you just can't. Can't do it. There's really so like, many uh, different lime, lime wire days. Like, oh, download lime wire. music. Mm -hmm. My iPod. Did I you guys like use Napster or was that before that your time? A little first. bit before me. Yeah. Was? Because yeah, I used I bet, Napster. I bet Jared had every Creed and Nickelback <laughs> song. Huh? I bet you had every uh, Creed, Creed and Nickelback song. Tell you song. what, dude. When I had my uh, my motocross accident, 
I didn't have an iPod yet, or oh, I yeah, lost I it or something. That. My dad bought me an MP3 player and loaded it with three albums of Creed. <laughs> <laughs> and so for two weeks in the hospital, all I listened to was Creed. That's great. Day in and day out. Take me higher. <laughs> <laughs> For real, man. <laughs> oh, dude. But you're right. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, like, and I still, I thank God I did it. I found, um, we used to film all of our deer camps for, you know, oh, nice. for as long as we can. Old school VHS type stuff. Like this? Yep. Oh, like yeah. Like this? Yep. No, no, no. Old like school this. on the yeah. shoulder, right? In the 80s and stuff. And so I found <laughs> I found all those VHS and I converted them to DVD and then eventually on the digital. So, like, they, they live on Vimeo now. I send them to, like, I, once I, I think it was two or three years ago, maybe during COVID. I sent them all, and I was like, hey, guys, took the time, finally got these. And it was like instant. Everybody was like, God, we miss this so much. We should mm -hmm. do a, a movie night here when, if for a podcast. We should yeah. just watch those old Oh, old it's movies. funny. Like, to see my dad, dad and here. stuff in, like, the in the like late 80s and stuff at deer camp. Oh, oh yeah. Here are some of the stories. Like, my uncle's talking about shooting the spike, and he's like, sure. shot it, hit it in the shoulder. I jump up and, like, bam, 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 like, straight from the hip. Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, God. Oh, I grew up watching this, too. There's, you know, there's 80s. Any style films with the whole tape deck or the one that had like a little insert where you put a smaller one into it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got yeah. shoe boxes. For, that's why I originally got it. And probably how I ended Dude. up meeting you and brought me here is just loving, loving filming. <sighs> that's just funny. Taking man. those videos. I used to, I, the first, um, first time I ever filmed, I was probably 14 or 15. My dad filmed me shoot a button buck with a flintlock after christmas that's pretty cool um and it yeah it was you know it was funny you see these deer coming through the pine you could hear the like because it's so cold you could hear it like because it's trying to record on the tape yeah and uh yeah button buck comes in and like you know smoke you get and i was like yeah i got it i got it you know and it's running off in the and like it it's fun to go back and watch some of those things and you know that's what got me into filming any of my hunts was just not necessarily they'll have it and brag and be like, look at this. It was like, you know, three years later to go back and watch a hunt. And you're oh, like, yeah. man, that was cool. Like I completely forgot that happened. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, then it just started to be like, I carry more and more gear in and more and more gear. And then eventually it's like, holy shit. Like this is a lot of stuff to carry in. You oh, know? it is. And, and it's, it's hard to get it. Just as difficult as pulling the trigger. And that's why, you know, like that buck hunt, like, it's so hard, you know, to film turkeys or deer. But you make it all work. It's like I can't believe this just happened. Everything just worked out right. Yeah, like I, shooting a turkey with a bow and arrow without a ground blind in Pennsylvania that's been dodging me for its entire life and my dad. And then he just walks in first time, first time ever hunting together. Can't read each other. Nothing. <clears throat> it was that. It was that date at Jack's Bar and Grill. Yeah, it ain't that hard. <clears throat> <laughs> this guy. Over here. <sighs> mm, guy never used instant messenger to pick up a check. <laughs> yeah, it, it faded quickly, man. I think I don't know if Facebook took over or it MySpace. Did. We had MySpace. Well, we got phones. See, up. I didn't go into MySpace yeah, at all. I, I was really Facebook was because when I graduated high school, it was, it was the next the next that freshman year of college was Facebook. I mean, ultimately, dude, it was, it was texting. Like you know, phones came out. I had like the MV two, and you could text. You could text. Mm -hmm. Girl, you know, you had numbers, dude. I remember. Did you guys do your senior weeks at Ocean City, Maryland? I wasn't real into the really? so, the social scene. I never went to prom. I never did senior. You week. didn't go to prom. Mm -mm. My parents were what? pretty. My parents were pretty strict. Th they didn't let you go to prom. They would have let you me. Do? Uh, dude, just, I've always let just... you ride motocross, but they won't let you go to prom. Yeah, you, you took a face plant uh, into a pool. Hold on, Dwayne. No, 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 no. Dwayne in here. They would have let me go to prom. I've just always been kind of anti institutional, and so I I just wasn't into the prom thing. That's why I'm not into opening days. I'm not into interesting. Yeah. A little hipster. I didn't picture that. A little, a little bit, bit of hipster. A little in bit me. of hipster. Yeah. I didn't picture that. I figured you would have took you for a prom guy. I had five or six girls ask me to prom. Well, yeah, I that's what no. I figured. I was like, I don't really. Want was to it five or six? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, five or six. Five or six. Fifty-six. I remember. I felt real bad about some of them. And you weren't in no senior week with like your buddies down to like Ocean City or anything. No, I think it was hunting or something. It was June. <laughs> <laughs> Were you hunting bear out in Manitoba? <laughs> that's where I was yeah. senior week. Huh. Yeah, I just never was real into that stuff. I was just bow hunting, and that was back in the day when I had a cell. I think I, had I was my, probably filing traps or something. I had my dad's <laughs> yeah. cell phone at senior week, and uh, I, I ran up like a five hundred dollars cell phone bill because it was oh, like yeah. when if you were out of your state, it was like roaming charges. <laughs> yeah, when oh boy, you, was, you had to work summer job for that one. Yeah, a lot of manual labor over that one. You went to prom? Mm -hmm. Do you go to prom? Yeah, of course. You how many proms did you go to? 
all of them, I guess. I don't know. I went to three. Three. So I think three. three. Junior, senior, and then I went back when my girlfriend was a yeah. senior. I went to a uh, freshman, sophomore, or a white tux. It's yep. fun. Yeah, that seems weird. I, like I was like, a, I picture you as the it, guy who would be all about prom and no, stuff. Kind of a under the radar. Back then, you are not now. You're fl- you're you're on the radar. Listen, all these people nah. listening, they nah, you're still, on the radar. I'm still There's probably the girls writing in right now. They're like, I asked Jared. I asked him. What an asshole. He said yeah. he was going with so-and-so. But he was so nice because some other girl asked him too. Katie Nemeth was the one that comes to mind. I felt bad because she Shout was- Shout out to Katie she, Nemeth. Yeah, she was a good friend, you know, and I, I just, I was like, I'm not going. Sorry. Wow. <laughs> She's like, not even for me. I was like- anti institute. Nah. Did you go to like Sadie Hawkins dances and stuff or- No, but I, speaking of, I guess- anti- So just anti-dance, anti well, every listen, year. There was a- That's like a hermit. There's, there's I don't think I've so- ever seen him dance. There's a song called- Yeah, I can't dance. There's a song called uh, Sadie Hawkins Dance by mm-hmm. Reliant K. Uh-huh. That I sang for like the American Idol in our oh, uh, yeah. elementary school. Very nice. Yeah. You know that song? It's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah, I know that. Old Girls, that's the guys. It's always you know, a surprise. A yeah, I know. There's nothing better. You we were talking about pictures. Oh, oh. We were talking about, uh, I used to go to that bar or whatever that would be that punk bar on 22 and it was you know freaking knuckle puck came back to millville like two weeks ago no i did not i found out like the day before i was like "Eh, we're not gonna be able to make it who were they there with Mm, Aunt molly i assume i think that's who they're touring with i didn't see it at all i've got a there's a girl that works for us that's like she's big into knuckle puck so she she lets me know she's down with it Mm -hmm. that'd be a good aol name knuckle puck knuckle puck yeah. yeah, Knuckle Puck three six nine. Not so much, little Flinter. <laughs> what were you saying? Sorry. Is AIM still around? I wonder if you could <laughs> download an AOL well, account, make your know. info. I would just, I know, I would be digging, reading some of those old chats. Do you think you could remember your old oh, password? Probably, it's the same that I probably use <laughs> yeah, now. <laughs> heck, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah, Buckmaster. Uh, AOL. AOL. Well, it's well, that's Messenger. email. It's AIM. 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 Yeah. That door would shut and it would just break your heart. A I M. You were waiting, left you hanging for a message. They would log on and you'd send a message and then you'd mm. see that they have an away message. Mm-hmm. Oh, the away message. Or you'd hear the door open and then you'd look and you'd see, you're like, oh, there she is. And then you'd hear, yeah. and that would be the door shut, meaning they left and that would break your heart. Oh, I've heard that. Yeah. I had one. Now, now that I think back, I, I had one for a short period of time. And then I think phones came around shortly after that. And so I was like, oh, I'll just text them. Yeah, that makes sense. Facebook came in. I was born in 93. So, I mean, it was. Yeah, because ten you, you would have been 10 when Facebook came out. 2003. Yeah. I Did Facebook have a Messenger feature, though? Oh, forever. Yeah, now it's just Messenger. Mm-hmm. It always had you that? always had that private chat message. Did it? On the sidebar. Private bar. message, yep. It was just like. AIM. I don't remember. I don't. It's one of those things. I watched the uh, the Social Network the other day again because it's a good movie. Good movie. Uh, I just watched Jobs the other day. Oh, also good movie. Great movie. And uh, like I was trying to recall because I'm sure I was Jobs. sitting in my dorm room <laughs> freshman year and I get this email about like Facebook for Penn State and I'm like, what? Should, we should sign up for this. This is cool. Like I wish I could remember like being in that moment of like understanding that. But it's funny, dude. I I can remember some. Sp- like <clears throat> nothing in particular, but I can remember sitting in my parents, like we call it the fish room. It was our computer room, but it had like fish wallpaper on it. Mm-hmm. It was a fish room is where our computer was at. And I would be, that's where I had like lime wire mm-hmm. and I would have like my Facebook account. And you like, think your dad would have uh, shunned you for using lime wire. It was Jared no. station right there. No, he knew I was using it. I don't think they knew what it was. It's the fish room. Yeah. The fish room. What happens in the fish room stays in the fish room. <laughs> That's his workshop. It was like a conjoining room. It, it conjoined our uh, conjoined. I think I can see the fish room in my had red wallpaper. Maybe. Yeah, with like by the, the fish room. with the hook mouths on it. The male male I, fish. I think so. I love. Have you been in that old house? Several times. Remember when I first got Hank? I was going to bring Hank. I didn't know the protocol on dogs. Yeah, yeah, I remember but that. When we first brought my dog back from Iowa, yeah, we, an opal. And you pee. I remember all over that opal by accident. Well, I ran, under, bear, ran under my stream. He was standing there. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to give I my mom that. this dog, and I, we'd like. You're like you just head. peed all over my dog. <laughs> like you peed all over was, your bear. It was my yeah. mom's dog, and like we had to wash it off. It was all wet. She's like, "Why is it all wet?" I was like, "Oh, we gave it a bath." I do remember. It smells that. like a spare. Yeah, you've been to that house. <laughs> What's the deal with peeing in a buck scrape? 
<laughs> what do you mean? We're talking about P. We're P talking, is P. We're, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was one of those guys who um, I think I've always peed out of a stand. Well, I chewed tobacco, so I spit out of a stand. I, I think that's I got that from you. I, I used to be real paranoid about peeing out of a stand. Now it's like five, six times every hunt. Yep. Make some noise, though. I mean, you got to pee on the side of the stem oh, yeah. of the tree. Yeah, because then it goes. and catch. <laughs> Oh, no. See, I'm trying to make that pee noise. I want them to think, oh, oh something's some, pissing up something's there. Something's peeing over there. Uh -huh. They're probably be like, I don't want to go up near that. Yeah. That's a strong stream. I, used to I let be... out some grunts. I'm like, you know, stream, and I'm like, <laughs> yeah. bro, bro. you create a little scene. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to be a straight bottle. Reenactment. You know, from oh, the yeah. stand. But what? then, a bottle. But that's like why I big couldn't. Fiji one liter. That's why I couldn't sit all day because I'd fill that bitch up yeah. in like the first hour. I just make sure I hit between. It turns into a ham warmer, too. I just make sure I hit between my knees, you know, on the way down, and I rub, rub, little rub. Yeah, that's a good spot. I know. But I, I feel like anymore when I see a buck scrape, mm -hmm. I'm peeing in it because yep. I've heard yep. that that's a thing. I definitely pee in them in the pre-rut. I don't know if I pee in them during the actual rut themselves. You don't want to confuse them? or? Yeah, I don't know if it uh, – I have a feeling that they probably have hormones that are not passing through my body um, that maybe come out in my pee. Maybe you need to bottle his pee because mm -hmm. he probably has some crazy hormones. Mm -hmm. It's all that pre work. I've never not peed in a scrape unless I just didn't have to pee. Do you pee in the in the rut too? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it makes any difference. Pre rut, I definitely do, especially if I make a mock scrape. I don't think they're attracted to it. I just think it literally makes no difference. Well, it's the the urine, the urea breaks down in the same manner. Basically, yeah, maybe just has a little bit of ammonia smell. They're like, that's pee. I don't think mm -hmm. they can like it smells like asparagus. But they can like recognize, and also they're taking dumps. So maybe we should be taking a dump in these things. Yeah, that's the one thing that I will say that I am still pretty cautious of is dumping from the stand. I know you are too. You only take a poop in a river or a creek. <laughs> well, that's just a preference. But <laughs> is it? Yeah. I thought it was a smell. Oh, dude, I'm actually pretty proud of my I thought you it know. was a smell cover up. No, 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 no. I uh I do I do think there's <laughs> stocking brown trout in the yuck. Yeah. <laughs> Pulling I, downstream as soon as this thing flows. Like, what the hell? Is I, this? I do think there's I think there's something to the you know like cause coyotes, like if they if they yep. smell your trap, they'll yep. dig it up and poop on it. 100%. That's like a F you, mm -hmm. you know? Yep. So, so yeah, I, I try to refrain, but it is purely out of preference. The reason for that Unless is, you have ton, tummy rumbles, then you just got to go. I've yeah. done it. I've done it out of the stand. Yeah. Because well, of tummy rumbles or just because you had to go? Well, okay. So in that specific scenario, uh, I was hunting a new area and I, I had hung the stand. And when I got to the stand in the morning, there was a, a, a letter there that says, hey, this is so-and-so. I've been hunting here for however many years. And appreciate it if you move your stand and i'm like okay after this was i with you no no I was, well maybe it's another time but i was like okay yeah after this hunt, land I, 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 <laughs> after this hunt i'll pull the i had permission to be there and stuff yeah i was like i'll pull the stand and, and get out of there <clears throat> about like 9 30 my tummy got to rumbling and i was like <sighs> i was like oh, man i gotta go and i was like i don't know if i can make it down so i just turned around and i grabbed the tree and you know i just i dropped one right off the front of the stand yeah pulled stand and <laughs> never looked back yeah, I mean, but that style though is the, for the same reason that I prefer the uh, the river, mm -hmm. especially in the Midwest, because you can you can find a nice nice river bank you can get down on with a, a big solid root system you grab a hold of, you can just arc right up on her and like you said, stock some brown brown trout. I like taking my pants off because completely. <laughs> I'm when I do you when put I'm, your boots back on. There's an art to this. So like wow, when I was at a party one time, I was a Marion Center with a bunch of Marion Center kids. Mm -hmm. You, know, you do like taking your pants off. That's yeah. why you're always so he always calls me on the toilet and he's like, Oh, look here, I'm just dropping a deuce. I can see like bare kneecaps. So I'm like, what are you doing? So I make my decisions. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I was at a party one time and I was, you know, it was like a keg party, you know, high school or whatever. And I pulled down the shorts and the undies because I had to go to the restroom mm -hmm. and I went right inside my pants and my Ooh, undies. Yeah, mm. that's not good. So that has always scarred me. So I'll you were outside, leg. like squatting. Yeah, I was outside yeah. squatting, but like you, you know, didn't I, have the lean right. And I had to walk in front gravity. of everybody all naked, and everybody was clapping, and they thought you know I did something fun. I was like, no, no, shit on everybody. Yeah, like, I got, I gotta go. Like, flick my feet out and everything, and reach in, <laughs> oh. grab my keys and my cell phone. So I'm scarred because of that. So now every time I go to the bat, I work outside. You know, yeah. so every time. I go to the restroom outside, which which it's, it's, it's a, a lot. lot. Yeah, I do at least one leg all the way out with the pants over here, and that way I have <laughs> a lot of room to work with. That's a big uh, mental scar, man. It got me. I haven't done it the same since. And like putting two hands behind you, no, that's no, you don't want to do that. You know, it's a, a game changer. That I guess you can't do it in a toilet because you you can't flush them. But wet wipes are uh, mm. oh, absolutely. Yeah, my dad had these ones since COVID. He puts in his office bathroom. And I'm thinking, oh, there's your butt wipes. It's mm -hmm. really nice. So I finished up, and I wiped, 
and I'm screaming and yelling, and I look at the pack, and I'm like, what is happening? And it's 90% isopurple alcohol. Oh, <laughs> disinfectant. Oh. And then my oh. dad's like, oh, I did that to me, too. Don't worry. <laughs> That'll clean you right up. And I was oh, like, Dad, boy. you can't just leave those on top of the toilet. Isopurple alcohol uh, in the bottle. One of my uncles, so to, to your pooping in the pants story, <clears throat> back in the day, probably oh, before yeah. Jared's time, uh, they had the one-piece uh, blaze orange. Yeah, jumpsuits, the classic. right? The, yep, the, the classic. Pump, the pumpkin. You want to yeah. splash? No, I'm good. Okay. And uh, so, you know, it, it's like, like we're around the campfire, camping outside, opening weekend of deer season or opening day of deer season. And he's like walking around everybody. He's like, what the fuck? And, and eventually my dad was like, like, Rick, what the hell are you doing? He's like, man, I smell shit. <laughs> like, and he's like, what do you mean? He's like, I smell. Here he pooped. And when he pulled it up, it got caught in his hood. Oh. And it was sitting in the hood <laughs> behind his house. Who did that? Rick. Rick who? Nedley. <laughs> Dude, I've heard that story told so many times <laughs> by so many different people, including myself uh, that's and my dad story. and my grandpa. It's, I mean, my that I don't know if everybody's actually done that or if everybody just Uncle Rick thinks that probably, one of their uncles did. Uncle that. Rick probably told. I know for a fact because like it was on video. Told probably your dad at church. I bet at one point in time because that's how we met. No, it's my uncle that tells a story, and my D uncle Dale. Maybe we found oh, a fatal flaw shout out to in, Uncle those, Dale. in those one pieces. I would challenge anybody that's listening to this podcast if you've made it this far. Uh, you know, if you know somebody that's told that story before, because it's yeah. it's a pretty common story about shitting in your hood. Because, yeah. dude, literally before you told that story, I was like gonna mention mine, and yeah. I was like, I'm pretty sure a lot of people, yeah, have told that story. It's whether a fatal it flaw or with not. a hood, probably hood in a one piece. Now you know why I take mm -hmm. off mm -hmm. and you separate. I, you're, you're, you're I vomited it. from the stand this year when I was in Ohio. I was real hungover. And I mean, I, I just let the safety harness hang me and just. Did I did that? And I mean, I've let it torch. Cor Corey and I were two in two different stands, like 10 feet away, five, 10 feet away from each other. Day after Thanksgiving, same thing. I woke up. I was like, Ugh. just torched it. Yeah, That's I made terrible. it to the stand. It was so quiet. And then I just. Yeah, I didn't feel great. Yeah, still, still, a, still a deer coming. Yeah, through. yeah, you get to be, you get to be, well, our age, but again, my old, age man. and above. Yeah, you figure out how to handle yourself in the woods. The most there. hungover I've ever hunt hunted was two years ago, opening day of turkey season, and I called in a whole mess load of big long beards, big group. And I was like, "Dad, you shoot first. And he pulls up, bang, shoots. Bird goes right down. It was my turn. Same yeah. thing. Birds on top. I picked yeah. the biggest one, and I shoot. Well, I normally shoot for like the neck. Yep. You know, not a headshot guy. Mm-hmm. When I shot, I took off a chuff, like right at the shoulder. Like I missed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it's going down on this bottom, right where Kuhar killed his bird, and it's all skunk cabbage. Oh, yeah. And the skunk cabbage was pretty high a couple years ago early. And it, I felt like Chris Pratt in Jurassic World because you're hunting like this dinosaur, <laughs> and it would like pop up pop of its head and look around, and I'd be like, ah! and I was real close with a full, full, <laughs> and boom, and I'd miss it. It would, just, it would go back down. Just skunk cabbage. <laughs> and it, it would of, pop uh... up again, whoop, and I was like, there you are, son of a bitch. <laughs> Boom. And he shout. My dad's like, you're wasting shells. or five bucks a piece. <laughs> and I'm like, I got one more. And I had this one last one. It's a two and three quarter inch, you know, dove load. And I got up and this bird's running Jeez. away from me. And I was like, wham. And I got him. And I just like went up to him. And he was just all destroyed <laughs> and ruined. But it was like, if I would have been totally focused and calm, yeah. you know, not hungover, not dehydrated, not focused, I would have definitely got him one shot. It. But there I am, you know. Blasting shots. This oh, thing, we've all mud. been there. We've all been there on hunts. Dude, I know a lot of guys that like it's more about the drinking. <laughs> that, that, a lot of the deer camps are that way. I don't like, understand how camps. those guys like enjoy the next. It, it can't. I can't function like that anymore. No, I'm dude in Kansas. I'm good for you know. You get one two highlights of me. I'm like time for bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, normally we're we're smoked at that point too. We're freaking yeah. exhausted. Yeah, especially if you're out and you're hunting, like really hunting in rifle season. We've we've thrown season. some drinks back in, in Kansas, though. Oh, yeah. I remember that especially time coming back from, uh, what were we doing? I'm sorry to interrupt you there, Mike, by the oh, way. I, I wasn't, yeah, you, didn't, you didn't interrupt. We're coming back from, uh, what were we doing? It was late at night. It was you, me, Steve, Marcus, whoever else. We noticed that basketball player. We were filming. Oh, we were, um, so we were, that was shed season, yeah. for sure. And... Yeah, we, we had shed hunted all day, and then we just got loaded up, right? And we were going to go probably to Kev's, I would assume. Yeah. And so we stopped at Casey's. If you're in the Midwest, Casey's is yeah, the place yeah. to stop. 
and old red beard. Yeah, we were making fun of Steve for buying beer or something at first. Well, I think it was because was I doing a Steve impression? You, you and I were lit, and yeah. Steve was not. And so, and Marcus funny. wasn't yeah, either. It's not exactly, funny. That's exactly what's what your number. Was. What's your drink count? What are the numbers? Yeah, what do you want? Like, do you need to get rid of going to the gas station? He's like, what is this? This card doesn't even work. <laughs> and it, yeah. And, so, card. and then, so Marcus like leaves and he's talking to, uh, these guys and he's like, yeah, that one guy, I forget what his name was, but he, basketball he, was, a, he player. was a Kansas, like, and he was a good Kansas basketball player. Yeah. He's sure. like, oh, that's Tyler Reed. I think it was three point. I was like, yeah, man, Tyler, Tyler, big fan, man. Yeah, big fan, man. Three We're from point, Pennsylvania. Three yeah. point specialist, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the professor <laughs> and then and Marcus and Steve are like I freaking hate these guys <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I mean we and I mean you could do it shed hunting although that I think that was the trip where um no it wasn't it was when you and when we were hanging stands that you were sick and it was like 100 degrees oh. we're sweating and then Jared and I just had seed ticks like loaded on us i was sick as a dog yeah and steve was like i don't have a single tick on me and i'm like i'm, I'm pretty sure i'm immune <laughs> i couldn't see a skin i'm like i'm pretty sure it's scared of me yeah <laughs> <laughs> and it was like i you know we're just like literally there's like dozens of them on us like little and baby he's like, tinies he's like nothing nothing on me and i'm like it must be what? my blood type <laughs> I always thought that was funny. I was like, how, how did you get to know your bosses like really well? I was like, picking ticks off their, <laughs> off their lower back. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Steve's like, check me. Check my, check my balls. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> I'm going to do like what Mike does in the woods and take my pants off. <laughs> Put them out of my head. Uh, we had rented the house like next door. Somehow it was like an Airbnb. Mm -hmm. and we like just rented this house in the middle of this Kansas town next door. Oh, dude, I love Kansas. I want to go it's back cool so place. bad. What a cool place. Yeah. We'll be there. Got our tags in, ready to rock. Yeah. Cool place. Well. What do we miss, Mike? Just happy to be here. Any this other stories you care to share about our, our, our comings up and uh, <laughs> how we got to... I thought the fact that we went on a date the first time we ever met was pretty funny. Yeah, that was great. I mean... That's a good was, one. It was great. We just knew we were, you know... We've had some good times since then. I think it was also just kind of like, you know, the Bigfoot. Like, you just want it to happen. It's like, okay, dude, I do cane, and he hunts, and he's going to school for business to do the same thing I'm going for digital media art, and he has this company, and there's this Jeremy Flynn guy, and he wears Cabela's, and they're going to interview me on the phone. Uh, like, this seems too good to be true. Whatever happened to the Cabela's thing we are talking about a couple months ago? I, don't know, I just didn't really follow up so much with it. But I'm saying when he was, weren't you? Oh, the, yeah. You were the Cabela's guy. I was. Yeah. Sorry, I changed the subject. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you know, it's just, you know. One more thing to add to the arsenal. I mean, I would love to do some pro staff work. And so, what yeah. do you do now? You you work for a your a private timber consultant. I'm um, so I own Millstone Land Management, Millstone Forest Service, and Millstone Environmental. Okay. So we do environmental consulting, you know, forestry consulting, and like land management implementation. Mm -hmm. So a lot of landowners will call and say, like, we just did this home show in Indiana. And I have this property, and my son likes to hunt. And I'll be like, oh, great. <laughs> Is your customer Adam Sandler? <laughs> I, would, I, was gonna I would like you to come take a look. Uh, I was like, oh, okay, yeah. So you go out to these people's property, and I promote. Oh, the penguin. <laughs> Fitty penguin. But, you know, we basically create a landowner objective, whether mm -hmm. it's a gas company, a coal company, the Allegheny National Forest mm -hmm. Service, the Game Commission, you know, or whitetail properties yep. and they say hey here's what we want you to do and i go in and my expertise is plants identification insects disease invasives parks recreation habitat um implementation to you know achieve your landowner's objective yep so we have landowners like you know old grandma that wants to build a food plot for her grandson because he mm -hmm. talks about that yeah sure we go out we build food plots and that's great or hey we just strip mine this huge you know 100 acre area we need to implement um, so many trees, uh, we want to make a prairie habitat. We want to clean up the stream. We need some riparian buffer zone work. You know, just we, we're, we're land, we're land specialists. So we go in and we have, you know, we all have a great education and background and experience and we implement, um, solutions to, the, to meet the landowner's objective. So a lot of times it's just a standard timber sale or, Hey, I have this property and I want more white walking and hiking and biking trails mm -hmm. or, Hey, this is a, a timber company and they bought this and they want to manage this over a long period of time. And we go in with machines and we assess what's going on. What are the issues? How do we fix those problems? And the majority of the money that Millstone's made is on invasive plant treatment 
or on stewardship work. Mm -hmm. So whether you're a township, a municipality, a forest or a, a logging company, or just a standard private landowner, we come up with an objective and create solutions to meet that objective. And we, a lot of times meet that objective with sustainable objective forestry. So we have an issue, we have a problem, it's going to cost $30,000. Well, you have $150,000 worth of standing timber here. Right. Let's cut out just enough based on what tax bracket you want to be yeah, in and pay so on for and so it. forth. And it's sustainable, it's objective, and it's forestry. But for me to come onto the podcast or even put on my business card, uh, you know, I've removed the title forester because traditionally a forester is pretty simple job. Mm -hmm. Come in, we scale your timber, we sell your timber. Maybe we do some management. Sure. But what we've done lately that's been so impactful is instead of just going into an area and treating invasives or non-desirables with common practice like um, chemical or fire, we'll do spot treatment and we also use an emasticator. So it's this big rototiller that goes into the woods and it doesn't just, you know, you could I could maneuver around this this one glass very easily and leave this one American chestnut right here sure. or just this one flowering dogwood right there. And like a fire, you know, it's going to come through and your understory is all going to hit the reset button. And then odds are whatever is going to reestablish is going to be a pioneer species like yep. red maple, yep. birch, American beech. So we have a background on shade tolerance, shade intolerance, growth rates, pioneers, desirables, non-desirables. We create this magic. <laughs> and when you go back after a year or two without even doing a second phase of treatment, a lot of times, the emastication process, you're treating the soil, mm -hmm. and then the forest takes care of itself. Right. And in that time, you sell that piece of timber with a two-year contract to do two years of management, and it's pretty magical what you can do in two years of management if you focus on the soil, mm -hmm. not just what's on the surface. When you kill stuff off the surface, it's just like spraying a field. You know, you wait a year or two, it's all going to go back to whatever's sure. around. Yep. And uh, so that's like what we specialize in. It's a lot of fun. And, you know, I've been doing it. I've owned Millstone for... Coming up on seven years here, and uh, oh, a little, little closer. But it's you know it's, it's fun when you get to wake up in the morning and go to work with some buddies and cook stuffed flounder mm -hmm. over an open fire and take your dog or your horse to work. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a lifestyle that I've created and found a lot of success. We managed over fifty thousand acres in Armstrong County alone our first five years. Holy cow, man! That's so, crazy. You know we've had some really good clients, and then also just falling in with. Uh, some really cool townships, municipalities, and private landowners here um, in Western Pennsylvania. And uh, so, what counties do you operate in mainly? From, the, from New York to West Virginia to Ohio. Wow. You I mean you name it? If the margins are there, yep. I'll drive there and take a look and yep and consult. So, you know, right now I really like doing a lot of food plot work. Mm -hmm. So going in, getting a look, what's there. Explaining to the landowner an objective, which is usually a, a one pager. Yep. Say, so here's the objective. Here's where we're at. Here's mm -hmm. what we're doing. Keep everybody on the same page and saying, hey, you have this three acre food plot you want to make. It's going to be $5,000. And they'll be like, oh, five grand. That's a little more than I wanted to spend. At where you say, well, you have $100,000 worth of timber on your property. Mm -hmm. Would you like to synergistically match that up? And then in the synergistic process, you're creating skid trails with removing, yep. you know, the trees. You're creating landing zones for your landing logs, which is a great food plot access area. So it's kind of like, yeah, got to feed the geese, keep the blood pumping. Well, I think that's a, I mean, that's a really cool way. 365. It's, a, it's a cool way of looking at it because <clears throat> I think a lot of times you get the guys who are coming in purely from a timber evaluation sale perspective or purely to come in, even like what I've used in the past to open up a piece of ground and like, you know, it's just like, hey, I want this one acre cut open to a food plot. So for you to bring in a solution to offset cost based mm -hmm. on what they have existing, I mean, I think that's an easy way to do it and pay for, you know, you're you're essentially saying, hey, here's how, what we're going to do, and here's how you're going to pay for our services in this entire piece. Yeah, I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's pretty interesting that <clears throat> we've heard more and more frequently from, you know, land guys, people that are spending time, you know, offering services having to do with land. We talked to my good buddy, Jed Colbell the other day. And Shout out to Jed. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> this buck right here on the table. Mm -hmm. That's where I shot that buck. And, uh, you know, between he, he and you and some of these other guys we've talked to, it's like, it, it seems like more and more um, managing for wildlife has become kind of, you know, more more uh, front of mind or, um, you know, it's, it's in the picture now in terms of like, hey, I don't want to just do a timber sale. Like yep. I want to manage my timber, you know, and harvest some of it and also kill big bucks. 
mm-hmm. you know, and in the same way, it sounds like a lot of guys are, you know, uh, requesting your services to do um, invasive work or mitigate wetlands or, or whatever it is. They also want to kill big bucks uh, or, or just something having to do with wildlife. I want to you know, see more ducks or I want to, you know, kill more birds or whatever it is. And it's, it's, it's pretty cool that this like this land industry has become very intertwined with a, a wildlife um, lifestyle. So important, Be, you know, and I think that's where, you know, go outside of our country, go to South America and look at the, you know, timber raping, literally they've been doing down there and to the just dramatic effects on our own ecosystem and, and our own ozone and everything else. You know, there's a reason that the sustainable forestry is, is so critical. Mm-hmm. And yeah. also, yeah, you, I mean, in school, and you, I mean, we've heard this time and time again. I'm sure you've had guests on here from whoever, or wherever. They say, oh, timber regenerates, it's sustainable. It's sure. This, it's that. Yeah, but timber is a quality-based item. 100%. So if you go into an area and you harvest timber and you don't treat that ground cover, that, that understory, or most importantly, that soil, that determines the quality that you're going to regenerate. Mm-hmm. And so the best thing you could do for a landowner isn't just come in and do a timber sale or timber appraisal and say, hey, we're going to open this up. We're going to get this going. And here, a lot of times that's the last thing you want to do. Mm-hmm. You have to have people that know what's in there. If you have a duff layer, if you have leaf litter, if you have compaction, if you have facultative upland or wetland, if you have, you know, you need somebody that knows what's here now, what will be here after a timber sale and how do we, do the most important, like you mentioned, South America, all these other countries. Yep. Treating the soil is hands down the most important thing we could do on any property. Mm-hmm. And when you am- masticate, you're taking all that debris and that leaf litter and just those, you know, that six to eight inches, and you're mulching it all up, and then you're regrading it. I mean, not the entire forest, obviously, mm-hmm. but like crop tree releasing. I mean, you go and you work around a tree, and if it has quality, uh, suitable soil, it's going to promote growth for quality, suitable plants hmm. and if it doesn't then you're just going to have your stilt grasses sure and your inv- and your invasives and your exotics and stuff that out compete things because they grow better in the shade so that's what's really fun about being a scientist and going out with a crew of other people that know a lot more than me mm-hmm. or maybe i know something that they don't know and collaborating and coming up with new solutions and working on it and then the landowner has a really you know great product when he's all finished with yeah instead of it's hey you're gonna cut your timber hey i'm getting old i'm 75 i'm gonna cut timber and sell it to the boy well and we've all been on a, a property where timber's just been cut and then now what's growing back is shit yeah it's you know cult- yeah, it's high, i mean most completely high graded most foresters work off a commission base where they take a percentage of the money generated to the landowner yep whereas my approach is i mean i've never taken a commission i'll create a do not exceed based on <clears throat> like a commission or a value of the the sale but when you have an objective, and what's your objective? Well, I want to manage for this, this, this. My boy likes to hunt. And my daughter likes to fish mm-hmm. here. And it's like, okay, well, cool, Lander. Let's create this objective. And you create the objective, and then you give them an appraisal mm-hmm. of the value. A lot of times they're going, oh, shit. You mean to tell me I own all that? It's like, well, yeah. yeah. Like, this is yours. It's growing at 7 to 10% a year. Or it's dying back at 7 to 10% a year because it's, oh, you know, it's, over mature, post mature, it's you know doing you have you're having dieback, you have invasive crowding, you know you're losing mm-hmm. value. So without them knowing or having me to come in and explain that to them, you know they have no real idea of what they even own. And then they have like that to use as a line of credit on their property for you know tax breaks or capital gains. You know it's declared, and there's so many things you can do to that property with that value of timber, with that assessment, where you don't always have to just go in and cut it. Yep. Mike, are you able to help landowners apply for government uh, like assistance or funding for some of these projects? Um, I'm sure I could like direct them, but like the only thing like I really have them work with is like, um, like equip CRP. There's things that come to mind. No, not not so much here in Pennsylvania. I feel like that's more popular, and I could be wrong. You know, out west on a lot of other properties, we're just you know letting your fields grow up and getting tax breaks and so on and so forth. But what what I really focus on is implementation. You know building food plots, building habitat, building roads, building trails, building ponds, stocking fish, building riparian buffer zones, putting in a pipe or a culvert and working for a year or two on that land to, you know, to make it more profitable for the landowner in that finite amount of time that landowner is going to own it or at least have access to, hey, I got kids now and you're, you know, they're young or I got kids that are going to have grandkids and this is 
this is an investment. Like this is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And you're making these, these decisions for them, you know, or with them. And it can be really challenging. And more so than anything, my job is to really just communicate effectively to the landowner on how to achieve the objective. Yeah. And, you know, they'll say like, well, we like to hunt and fish here. I'm like, what's your biggest objective? Well, we like to hunt and fish here. Mm -hmm. so, okay. That's the objective. That's the objective. Well, my boy's going to get it someday. And I'm mm. like, okay, that's, that's something else that's important. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a big one because like even properties that I have, you know, I'm looking at it in the next. He wants to figure out how to give it to me someday. Negative. No. <laughs> um, no, I want to figure out. <laughs> my son. Yeah. I want to figure out how in the next three to five years, you know, I can sustainably take off some trees for not only to, you know, make up for down payments or whatever it might be, but also to improve the wildlife habitat. Like, you mm -hmm. know, it's like, here's a big group of white oaks, like they're overcrowding each other. Some of these can come off so that the other ones can, can thrive. Um, you know, and it's, but it's a scary thing too, because it's like, man, you cut a, you cut a tree that's 70 years old and you're not putting it back in place. Like once it's cut, it's cut. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's always been a struggle for me when I'm looking at my own properties is like, you know, here's a giant red, like I was just at one, I've got a red oak that is like 52 inches DBH. Like it's yeah, 200 just 200 years old or something. Unbelievable. And like, I remember a guy saying, well, yeah, you know, I'd give you X, you know, per board foot for this thing. And I was like, yeah, I'll never cut that tree. You know, cause it's just like, I, I couldn't fathom like putting a value on a 200 year old red oak, totally. you know? And I'm not saying that's every tree on the property, but you know, when you pull that trigger to cutting, especially, I mean, it's, it's a hard thing, <sighs> Dude, you know, to know. And you're too. changing an ecosystem. hundred percent. Just from cutting one tree. Yeah. Dude, 200 years. Plus. Crazy. I'd, I'd say 53 inch red oak. It was around when Thomas Jefferson was kicking. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, and it, you you look at this thing, and I mean, you walk up to it, and it's just it's Amazing. massive. It's a cannon. It's Dude, massive. That's we, we've had some moments like that as we've you know kind of been stepping into the the whitetail properties role, and uh, d just realizing like the uniqueness of and in, in how awesome land is, and, and trees obviously are, are a big part of that, but. But dude, it's just it's it's the real thing. It was Dan Perez that said it that way. Yeah, just pick He's it like, up dude, and there it is. it's not. We're not cranking these out of factory. It's like God made it. It's the real thing. Not making yeah. any more of it. You know, every piece is unique, and it's got. I mean, dude, even just a, a tree is the simplest aspect of it. Two hundred years. Think about, and it probably had the best suitable quality life. Everything was good. You can look into the bark, or it, through the bark. And look at the rings sure. and see when the cicada broods came out every 17 yeah. years. And you can see when it had an injury or when it got hit by lightning or when it defoliated. And yeah. I mean, it's just like this living organism that's going to be here for two or three times the lifespan of a human. So when a human hmm. comes to me and I get that, I'm a little Aldo Leopold guy. Mm -hmm. And like I look at it so differently than your typical average landowner because I've been really lucky not just to go to school and have a career and be working in this, but I like Jared, like I grew up with just access to so much property and being a land manager and understanding the trials and, you know, all the issues that go with land. And that's yep. why Yellowstone's such a great show. Cause it's like the conflict. Yeah. The conflict makes it so interesting. Yeah. But when it comes to land, there is so much conflict, whether Huge. it's you're walking up my well, stream. It's because it stands for freedom, I think. Is we, yeah. We kind of established land ownership is, is freedom. And it's like, an extension. You know, Yellowstone is an extreme example of that you own whatever, the hundreds of thousands of acres. But a lot of people aren't like you and I because they didn't grow up having access to understand. So yeah. it's kind of like an unwritten language if you didn't yeah. have, in your short period of time growing up to become an adult, access in to like what it takes to be a, a landowner and then the entitlement of being yeah. a land manager or no being a land manager the entitlement of a landowner and trying to also meet the objective mm -hmm. you know it's like you know aldo has a quote and uh i hope i don't butcher this but he said uh we abuse land because we consider it a commodity mm -hmm. something that belongs to us when we regard land as community only then can we begin to use it with love and respect. Yeah. And it sounds hippie, but at the same time, you look at a cornfield and you're going like, fuck, this is just corn. Like, this mm -hmm. sucks. Yeah. Like, once a year? Yeah. And then you go and you look at a prairie land or, like, a grassland, like, CRP or an orchard or, like, something with biodiversity where, you know, everything from mushrooms to, you know, an overstory of trees. And you're like, ah, oh, that's community. Community, And yeah. there's so much more because you can 
still harvest different things and do different things. Mm -hmm. But the job of the land manager is to explain that to the landowner. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the landowners are a lot of times stuck in their ways. Yeah. It's tough, well, dude, and <laughs> sometimes they're really open. To experience that too, I think is like consciously or subconsciously, like that the thing that we're, we're trying to to achieve, like in, in the same way that I've always avoided, <clears throat> you know, these opening day rushes where it's like, oh, there's, there's a guy over there, there's a guy over there. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel the same way about, you know, whatever it is, monocrop agriculture, you know, it's like, it's, uh, it just kind of, it's impeding on wilderness. And unless you've really ex experienced it, like, you know, like I did in Alaska or like we have in, in the Badlands mm -hmm. and stuff. I mean, dude, there, there are places that like, there is no human inter intervention required. Like, it's like the, the best thing is there's no people here. It's untouched. Sure. Mm. And it, there's, yeah, there's some magical places like that. They still exist. Fire, fire is like, you, you look at fire out in California and you're like, wow, this is horrible. Look at that mm. Chinook helicopter dumping water and chemicals out here. This is yep. terrible. But like, I look at Pennsylvania and I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, burn this entire yeah, like this, yeah, this place could do for a burn. Yeah, yeah. we were due for, we're like, overdue for burn. But burning. you don't have to use fire to Correct. fix soil and fix a plant issue. There are machines out there. Yeah. And I'm one of the first guys, if not the first. Yeah, I didn't know to people invent were doing these, that. these combinations and use them in such a regard. To so is it like a drum mulcher? Yeah. Yep. On high flow. Mm -hmm. And you don't want anything too big, but something where. Like you know, on a skid steer ass. Like, a, like yeah. Yeah. Like a 75 yep. high flow. And, you know, you have the horsepower to mulch the soil, break up all that litter, remove mm -hmm. all that debris on the surface. And you're putting something back in. And then what you're getting to come back out is of higher quality. And then you monitor it for a year or so. Mm -hmm. And then you open the canopy for your timber sale. It pays for yep. the work to be done. And it's all synergy. It's like Matthew McConaughey, revolutions, mm -hmm. revolutions. Mm -hmm. And it's great. And then the landowner goes back in and goes, holy shit. Yeah. I have another 400 acres over here. Or one of my landowners, you know, we did 1,500 acres. He's like, we got another 48,000 acres. Go to work. Like, we like this. But then you have to be able to tread lightly because you're working with land. And sure. who owns the land? Yep. You know what these people are like. Oh, yeah. Some of them are the best people, your best friends forever. I have a landowner that said, I don't know what you really even do. I'm a college professor at IUP. I teach safety. I know a lot about, you know, forestry, blah, blah, blah. But I looked at your website, and I've looked at some of your work past, and I was recommended by you. So just go do whatever you think and give me that objective. Mm -hmm. Checked all the boxes. And everything was great. He takes me to Yellow Creek Trout Club. We go fishing. Oh, yeah. Like, he's my homie. He's like 70-something <laughs> years old. I held his tree stand. He shot. He was like, where do I put my food plots? Where do I put my scrape lines? Where do I put my game? Can we do everything? You know, I'm getting paid to help this guy out. Yeah. And he shot a, like a 164. Jeez. On pre-rut, first day he hunted. That's awesome. And so now you have this level of comfort, and he trusts me, which is rare. Sure. Because it's like, what do you get out of this? Yeah. Because what has the logging industry and your traditional foresters done. Raped it. They've totally high graded, raped, take, they've taken everything that's worth value and mm -hmm. leave little because now they're, they, you know, they've- It's no different with the real estate market. I mean, we talked to a 100%. lot of people who have been burnt in the real estate market and it's always like, you know, it, it, I just, you, you know, I know how you get real estate guys work and it's like, uh, tell me, like, how do you think I work? Well, do, <laughs> do, do you know the difference is like in your situation, Mike, is that you care about the land. You know, like you value that relationship it's with the landowner. It's sending an invoice. It's really hard yeah. sending an invoice sometimes. Yeah. Well, dude, imagine for, for us in the real estate business, it's like, dude, in the same way that you do with, with timber and your wildlife projects, we love the land and we love to bow hunt and we love everything that, you know, this whole conversation has been about us understanding the value that's involved with that. Mm. And so when it comes to like a, like a transaction with that, you know, obviously we're, we're qualified to help with that as, as you are with your projects, um, you know, but ultimately... You know, we're not, and you're not like that standard. Hey, I'm here to, here to make money. Sure. You know, this is my job. This is like we talked about all these kind of yeah. skis bags that people are used to dealing with. It's like, dude, we or we love like government agencies too. Like the negative, like well, they just they're they're usually overworked, underpaid. Sure, you know, and they they sure. just come in and they just kind of tell you the the basics of it. They don't really put a lot of effort into it. Um, you know, and it's that's just kind of how it's been. 
you know, yeah. and people get a bad taste in their mouth. And that's the hardest part is if you find somebody fresh who hasn't had a negative Ooh, experience, yes. you're golden, yeah. right? Because you can, if you come off the way that you are passionate about it, it's like the call I had the other day with. Yeah, I, say, I think you got one. Yeah. yeah. Like it's genuine. It's good. But when you talk to someone who first thing they say is like, listen, before we get into this, I've done this before. I haven't had the best. Walls are up right away. You, you yeah. got your work cut out. Tear for the you. wall down. Yeah. yeah. And, and like, I've had a landowner too. He was a military guy and, you know, wasn't paying on time. You know, all, all the, all the boxes checked. I kept working with him. Really nice guy. Really meant well. Yeah. I really liked him. I still like him. But immediately, this is my land. Yeah. It's mine. And you got to look at it like, even if you own that land, you paid for it in cash. You bought that house cash. It really isn't your house. Yeah. You're still paying the man. Yeah. Because this oh, is yeah. America and this Taxes is community. Taxes and everything. Yep. Nobody owns anything. And yep. until you admit that and roll over and go, all right, tapped out, then you have that community where mm -hmm. you're part of it mm -hmm. and you have the ability to influence it in a way that you want in your objective. Mm -hmm. But if you're kind of like, damn it, this is mine and this is my daddy's before me and we're going to do this, your typical white landowner, mm -hmm. man, you really are limiting yourself. And it's so important to like get your neighbors together. Like Jared and I were talking about this too. Something I want to talk about on the podcast. I'll bring it up. Just about your neighboring landowners. Mm -hmm. If you have a neighboring landowner, odds are you have a tree right here and he has a tree right here and they're both on the line at the property corner because of a sense of entitlement. Well, I want to get that deer before it runs over yep. on his property. And he, you know, he, and he's thinking the same thing. Well, I saw my neighbor, I'm not going to say his name, but I really didn't know him and I never really talked to him. And he's a Penn State guy. Mm -hmm. you, know, I, you know, I met him at a tailgate. And uh, I look, and I'm like, it's a week, it's a couple days before season, and I'm checking my camera, and I'm like, what is he doing driving right in here? And he gets out of his four-wheeler, and he's looking around, doing the whole, oh, we got over here, and I'm like, oh, do it, just do it. And he reaches in, bag of corn, mm -hmm. and he's throwing corn out, which I'm all for baiting, whatever, mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> where are you happened? seeing this? Oh, no. Right here, and in, right where we found it. From a stand, or? He's on his four wheeler right in front of his tree stand. How are you observing this? From my land, like we're on the property line. He okay. doesn't know that You're I'm You're looking across. I see him. It's the day before season starts yeah. and I'm checking a camera. So my entitlement side goes, God damn it. Now I can't hunt here because he's right here putting bait out. Mm -hmm. I got to yell at this guy. So, and then I go, wait, take a breath. Let's think about this. So I pull up my phone. I go, all right, cool. Documented. So now I got him. Yeah. If there was ever an issue, yeah, I got, him. I got you. And now I'm thinking, okay, I don't need to get you. I've never even really hung out with you. Yeah. You're my neighbor. If I shoot a buck and it runs onto your property, I want you to be nice to me and let me go on here or whatever. Yeah. So I just showed up and as I'm walking over, I'm like, how am I going to handle this? Shooting from the hip wider <laughs> style. And I go, Hey man, I was like, what are you putting bait out here for? Now I can't hunt here on Saturday. And the guy's like, well, I don't, I don't hunt. And I'm like, yes, you did. <laughs> uh, what? Yes, this is did. for squirrels, oh, obviously. Yeah, like, clearly. Then, Didn't you see the sign? He put a big five-gallon bucket of apples out. And I go, where are all these apples from? He goes, well, there's an apple tree right over here. And I'm thinking <laughs> I to just myself, moved them. I'm thinking to myself, okay, he knows that I've got them. Yeah. Now let's... Let's 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 do some healing. Yeah. Let's find when when you when you're resolving conflict, you find common ground. How'd you do last year? Hey, you know we noticed that nice buck that looked mm -hmm. like this, and hey, I spotted here this summer and saw these bucks. Have you seen them? So I'm opening. I'm exposing to myself. Yeah. I'm showing them the private. You got to be careful when you expose <laughs> yeah, yourself yeah. in the you, private. You can, part. but sometimes you know it leads to a great relationship. We've all yeah. been there. Yeah. And you know, being <laughs> you're going out on a limb. I mean, yeah. yeah. Out on a limb. So yeah. now he's confused a little bit. Like, You've taken that? your pants off at this point. Like, like all right, you're, <laughs> you're like I'm kind of a one legger. I, did, you... I didn't mean to show you mine, but yeah. you know now you're showing me yeah. yours. And I just kind of like you know talk to him and everything. Next thing you know, he's like, "Hey, well, you know, I you know write about you in the paper with that one project you're working on. I'd like you to come to my house and take a look at this X, Y, and Z." I'm like, "All right, cool. Keep okay. going. Keep yeah. choosing. Yeah. We're talking. We're getting together. We're you know." And next thing you know, in his food plot that he built right on the property line, a little bit over, you know, and you know whatever, everything's cool. Out comes this beautiful ten point buck. Comes right into the food plot. We're standing there bullshitting. And I'm like, wow, this is the the, the magic yep. mystical this energy energy sauce yep. they're talking about. Yep. With, you know, Roar Borealis. And I look at him and he's talking to me and he's I'm like, hey man, this is how I resolve the conflict. I said, that's your buck. You hunt here first day. I got a lot of other places I can hunt because I have more land than him. Yep. And I said, but when you hunt at your spot, let me know. I was like, and when I hunt at this spot where we're top pin yeah. away from each other, I said, I'll text you and I'll let you know. 
And I was like, but I had a great time talking. He was really nice hanging out. This guy's like, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah, he's like, like, I think this like, guy was just about right, like, like waiting for like, the, uh, the warden to jump out of the bushes. But every time he hunted, yeah, he texts you. Text me. Every time I hunted, texted him. Yeah. And now we have this great relationship. Everything's cool. And it's all about like building that bridge. Yeah. And, you know, and with land, that is way easier. It's tough, man, because, I mean, like, I had trespassers on the Ohio place the other day. It's the first time that I've seen trespassers on it. And, like, my my instant reaction is I want to bury them. Yeah. The other know? day you did. Sure. Yeah. This is mine, God damn it. And yep. I want to bury Get them. off of mine. This I want to make this an is example. after the boot track we talked about? Yes. Different. Dirt bikes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And so now there's noise. There's yeah. there's an, and it's only been once in over three months. Basically, in a lot more invasive. Trail cameras. What's that? In person, trail yeah, camera. Trail camera. Yeah. Yep. And only one time, like coming up through. And it was like one of those days. It was like 80 degrees in March or whatever. Anyways, but yeah, my but then it's like, man, like if I piss these guys off, I, especially as an absentee landowner, I'm not there. Like, what are they gonna do? Yeah. You know, they're going to break into the cabin. They're going to be on this place all the time. Yes. You know? And so it's like, I don't make a, I have it. I have it documented. Mm -hmm. So if anything, if like it happens again, it's like, all right, I got to figure out who these people are and we got to have a talk. At this point, it's just documented on my phone and I just kind of push it down. It's March. What do I care? Like yeah. it's a whole different ball game if it's November. Yeah. But you just have proud to kind of. Proud of you for that. Thanks. Wisdom, man. I've I had some, I want, I mean, we've all been sharing our stories, yeah. but I've had some similar situations at the Dairy Mart with people imposing on me and yeah. it's like, okay, you know, I could flip out, you know, or, you know, just slow down and realize where, where this guy is coming from, what his mindset is. Sure. Mm. And, you know. Read. Give it time. Yeah, just give it, give it time. Dude, if it ra forms a pattern, rarely, there's an issue. Rarely, right? if ever, has an immediate reaction yielded but, the result. Know, but to go back to Flynn, so our family property was open. <clears throat> we would let any friends or family, whatever, no big deal. Yep. Like, where we, where we hunted, where you shot your bird and stuff, which is right near town in India. Mm -hmm. And my grandpa was like, oh, you work for me. You know, he had a lot of employees or were friends. You get to hunt here. Your family, you get, to, you get to hunt here. This is fine. This is great. Well, then we had issues on the property and I was a kid growing up mm -hmm. and I was 12. My dad just like recently retired. My dad just didn't want to have to worry about calling in another hunter or having to deal with other yeah. issues. So my dad said to his cousin, Hey, you can hunt here, but just you like, don't bring anybody else. But then he would bring, you know, mm -hmm. father-in-law and cousin and brother, you know? So then my dad said, Hey, that's just it. I want to hunt here with my kid. We got 400 acres or whatever. Everybody's out. Literally everybody from immediate family, you name, everybody's gone. Yeah, cut. cut, cut the ties. Well, that guy that was the, 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 the father-in-law to the guy that my dad, you know, mm -hmm. was the last straw, goes on to the other neighboring property and shot a guy in the face, blind. He's currently blind. I think he's dead now. Blind in both <laughs> eyes. He thought he was a squirrel. Broke his neck and fell out. The guy, the, the guy's property didn't even know he, either one of these guys were on the property. So here it is. When you're a landowner, you have a responsibility. Sure. And if you want to be a landowner like you, sometimes you have to say, all right, fuck, I got to do some yeah. invasive shit and I got to lose my mind and let these people know you never come back here again. Yeah. Because this is my responsibility to the land. Mm -hmm. And I'm the manager and I'm the resource. and I'm, So it's a sense of entitlement. For sure. That's that's a balance that you have to surf on that wave. It's a big one, man. Because like, again, I I swept that one under the rug. I have it documented. I'll be sure keeping an eye out. In fact, when I probably see one of my neighbors, I'll just say, "Hey, you know who these people are? Mm -hmm. If you talk to them, just let them know that I don't want to see them back on there, mm -hmm. right?" But mm -hmm. the next approach is more serious from that. And, and rarely, and you know, hopefully with, it doesn't have to go. You're, that when you're dealing with hunters, you're this is a I have a loaded weapon. Yeah. And you have a loaded weapon. Oh, dude. One of the scariest places, things I've ever ran into was with, I think we talked about this not too long ago, with my family as we were in Indiana, kind of up, up towards Glen Campbell. <clears throat> I'd shot a doe on Game Land's property. Yeah. And I was coming back towards our camp, and there, literally this guy owns a ton of property up there, right? We literally go around his property line, and we come back up on this log and we're walking out. And this dude comes flying out of nowhere crazy in his eye, loaded oh, yeah. gun in hand, saying how we shot that deer on his property and then we trespassed and cut through it. And we're like, no, shot it over here. Like, we'll take you to the gut pal. Here's where we walked around your... And it, like, wasn't having it. Mm -hmm. And had we, like, essentially escalated it, I guarantee somebody would have died that day, mm -hmm. 100%. Instead, it was like, hey, 
we're sorry. Like, this is what we did. We promised we didn't go on there. You won't see us again over here. And we had to defuse it and get out of there as quick as possible. And that's a situation where you don't engage. You don't? You can't. You, my sister, she has her PhD in conflict resolution. She teaches at Penn State main campus. Mm -hmm. She teaches conflict resolution. And she had me teach, I don't know how many students we had in the... Um, what is it, the ecology department mm -hmm. and they're all working on a project here this summer in the spring and they have to they jennifer my sister was like brought in to like explain to them how to diffuse situations how to handle such sometimes like the last resort you got to defend yourself for sure and it's either you or them if they're losing their mind yeah and you have to be prepared you know to either you know and most people can't take their minds to that level and that's 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 to what level to the defend yourself level. What do you mean? Like, like you're gonna have to strangle somebody, yeah, or, or like you're gonna have to shoot. You're gonna have to shoot somebody, or they're gonna shoot you if, if you, you don't shoot them. If you ask most people who carry a concealed weapon right now, if they actually think they'll ever use it, they'll tell you no. And in well, their mind, and that probably is the case. But in their mind, they don't plan to either. Mm -hmm. mm. And so you get put in a situation, especially a hesitant position. You hesitate. You may be in trouble. Yeah, you mean you can tell though, or you go to jail for the rest of your life. Usually, ugh, I think usually you can tell. Like you know, if it came down to it, you know I wouldn't hesitate. I mean, I had a guy. I know Mike wouldn't hesitate. I had a guy shooting mm -hmm. at me and the kids at Kentucky the other day because he thought we were trespassing on his property. I was on my own property, you know, and he's shooting up into the trees. Yet I've got my two kids there, and I mean, when That's when I met him, wild, you know, I had to recompose myself before I ripped his throat out. Sure, you know, because it's like, dude, I'm on my and I'm yelling at him. After he shoots, I'm like, I'm on my property. Who, Like, this is who I am. You know who I am. I'm on my property. I'm not on your line. I'm nowhere close to your line. I'm with the kid. Well, I thought so-and-so was... No, dude. I'm over here. Well, that's that sense of entitlement. How do you fix that entitlement? You got to walk up to the landowner and go, shit, he's spreading corn. I could lose my mind. Yeah. Here we go. And say, hey, you're my landowner. You, you're my neighbor. No matter what, we have to get along. Sure. So, like, when you buy a new piece of property, the one thing I would tell a new landowner is, like, get a hold of all your neighbors, all four corners, all six pieces, whatever, mm -hmm. or one side, and just say, hey, yeah, I'm your neighbor. But I moved into my apartment in Pittsburgh two years ago or whatever. I didn't know any of my neighbors, and I didn't go knocking because if I knocked on there, they'd be like, what, what, do, you, what do you want? Yeah. Oh, I'm your neighbor. Like, huh? and like, And it wasn't until, like, a month or two I ran out of sugar making cookies. And I was like, fuck, here we go. All right, neighbor. It's like smoking hot, nice chick comes to the door. Hey, how's it going? I was like, oh, this is great. Like, <laughs> you're, I, you're hot. Can I come in? Like, yeah, I was with my sister, Jennifer. And we did. She let us in the house and she gave us. Can I have some I sugar? sugar. We're making cookies. <laughs> I just need like, sugar. I mean, cookies. like to cook, to bake. Yeah. I mean, I could make a cookie. Do you take your pants off when you poop in the woods? <laughs> <laughs> but like, but how, how, that's pretty strange. And I just yeah. bought a house in Indiana and all the neighbors came to me and they're like, hey, welcome to the neighborhood. Yep. You know, good to see you. And like. So it, it is awkward, especially whenever it's awkward at first because we're a society of introverts anymore. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, do you want to go? I mean, especially in the, in the rural communities. I mean, most of us go to a rural community to get away from people, not there it is. to meet people. And like, you know, you fishing in this hole? Well, you go, it's like, uh, you know, hey, you fish this next hole, Brad Pitt talking. Yeah, uh, uh, hey, yeah. I'll get the next one. I'll, I'll get, get the, the next, next one. one. Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's, you know, that's the Aldo approach, the mm -hmm. community. Like, hey, you're you're my brother. Yeah, well, it's actually, important. I don't really now, know man. you. I'm actually just your neighbor. You're weird. So yeah. It's like, oh well, yeah, well, I'm definitely weird. Yeah. But hey, by the way, here's some jerky and a bottle of whiskey. I don't yeah. know if you like meat or drink whiskey, but you know, here it is. Yeah, like, community. We're friends now. Yeah, like you can trust me. And if you need anything, let me know. If I need anything, oh, and I should be able to rely now. on you. It's crazier now than it's ever been. You know, people just are are whack jobs anymore. You and know? COVID definitely didn't help. The cell phone hasn't really helped. And like, you know, these walls, you know, you hear about like walls and it's just really not the way. Nope. No, it's not. But I mean, the, and, and I am, I'm guilty, and Jared knows this, I'm guilty of gut reactions real, like, like he, something happens, here's my reaction. And usually it's over the top. And so I've tried to not do that as much anymore. It's hard. Probably get me shot at some point. So I might as well pull her back. But now. it also might keep you and your family alive a little bit longer. Sure. Yeah. Oh, there's plenty of times my wife will tell you, like, I'm a, I'm a big guy, like something happens and I'm like, screw it. This wow, is what happens. Dude, you know what? I've just, I've been bit by that enough times that I'm like, I've, I, I don't think I've ever once been like, uh, really pleased with the outcome of, of like a knee jerk reaction. Mm -hmm. I, you know, maybe it, it works. 
sometimes they work out. Yep. You know, it's like okay, it could have been. They worse. don't normally, and mm -hmm. I'm I, like I said, I'm super guilty of it. It's my personality. It's something I'm working on. Well, and it works to your favor because, like, I mean, dude, you're a salesman. You know, what I mean, it's, yeah, it works in that sense. You have an answer, and so yep. people are drawn to that. Yeah, it doesn't work in a reactionary knee jerk reaction to like a situation. Well, that could that's because you have me to balance you out, who says nothing and then helps figure <laughs> out what you said and how to make that happen. <laughs> Well, it works in that's that. That's why we're a good team. I'm just saying in terms of like a conflict, per, per instance, yeah. that guy's shooting at me, I come down and I knock his teeth out. Yeah. Like that's my, that was, as I'm walking the hundred yards between him and I, that's where mine's, my mind's going is I was defending my kids. I'm about to knock your teeth in and sure. you're choke on them. And then you got to pull that back to be like, listen, man, why in the hell would you not say a word and just start shooting Yeah. in a direction that you didn't even know who was up there or what was up there? Dude. Well, and it's not like you got to be everybody's friend. Like, no, no, no. I mean, and it wasn't a friendly. It's like, hey, now we're friends from this point. No, you shot at my kids. Yeah, like, it was a clarification of like, that is my property. I will be on it. You will he hear people on it. If you think it's trespassers, yell, and you'll hear one of us yell back and tell you who we are. Dude, I will. I will say. Go ahead. Jared. No, you go. No, you go. I insist. It's funny how a lot of the. I'll go. It's, <laughs> okay. it's funny sure. how those dude a lot of like good friendships like long-term friendships start with like a serious conflict i hear yeah. that time huh. and time again with like huh. like you said your your guy is perfect example of like you know you could go in and hey this is not what are you doing and this is messing me up sure. and, you know but because of the way you handled that uh, and i think this is fairly common for people that have figured out how to diffuse situations it's like if you can do that successfully and that immediately creates a bond like with it's just like i don't know burning a forest it's like man it hurts for a second and then all of a sudden it's like now you've got this flourishing mm, relationship like issue yeah exactly and it's like now you've got a, a relationship it was founded on this this thing you guys know that you can deal trust, with conflict the trespasser and, thing is the hardest part i and i will agree just because again it fe like that is an extension of you your property is an extension yeah. of you when somebody trespasses, that feels like they are treading on you, right? Mm -hmm. They're they are treating you with no respect. Um, but at the end of the day, like I see people on Facebook, you know, posting pictures and like, who is this guy? Like, I, oh, you yeah. know, I'm turning and it's like, dude, you don't know him. You haven't talked to him. Maybe That's not lost. My like, I don't know what happened, you know, and like before you go and crucify somebody on social media to the world, like figure out who it is. Yeah. Have a try to have a conversation with them and and go from there. Don't just go out there guns a blazing. It's almost exactly. like allegations. Oh, and yeah, and f I mean, I'm I'm not a official dad yet until August. But so my my girlfriend, she runs or works out every day at like this this park. It's, you know, and so she goes to this park and she runs and she does her thing every day. It's her escape. Yep. And if she doesn't get that run or that walk, especially on a nice day, mm -hmm. she's a little bit disappointed. And like yeah. then that affects me. Sure. So she goes on this run. You know, she's 10 miles or five miles, whatever she's doing. You know, she's nuts. And she's just great shape, just needs to, just gets it out. Like she's yeah. a sender. And she calls me and she's like, my run was short today. And I was like, oh, yeah, what happened? She goes, well, these two dudes pulled over and these rednecks pulled over. Not you kind of rednecks. That's yeah, why I don't right? identify. Oh, that's why I don't. And they were waving dollar bills at me. And she oh, had wow. her headphones in. She couldn't hear. She's like, but they were saying, I think, some pretty gross stuff. Yeah. She's like, and then they power braked over, over, it was snowing. They power braked over the snow and just blasted me with snow and rocks. So I'm hearing this, mm -hmm. and I'm in the shower, and I'm out of the shower. You're boiling And at I'm this boiling. Point. I'm you, walking yeah, out yeah, there. Yeah. And so she, I'm like, where are you at now? And she's like, well, I'm leaving the park, and I'm going to Martin's. And I was like, what, the, what kind of car? And like, <laughs> yeah. and I'm grabbing the pistol. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm grabbing the dogs yeah. and the keys, and I'm wet, and I want to watch Seinfeld and go to sleep. You know, yeah. you know, it's you know getting dark, and so I immediately hang up with her. Right? She tells me to make a model of the car and everything, and I call the state police and yeah. I say, hey, I'm really worked up. Like, I think it's largely due to the fact that like I just found out I'm be a dad. And my yeah. my girlfriend was just you know harassed, and yeah. then they power braked her and blasted her, and she doesn't exaggerate ever. Yeah, and I'm going here. And mm -hmm. I think it would be smart to send a trooper. And they were like, okay, well, you know, we'll send somebody. I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. Like, no, I know yeah, you're short-staffed. Yeah. Like, I'm showing up here with an intent, and I don't know what my intent is. Yeah. And I know I'm on a recorded line. Yeah. Get somebody, somebody there somebody. now. So I show up, and I see them. They're the only ones there. And I'm, you know, I'm just like you. I'm like, oh, you yeah. motherfucker. And I'm watching them, and I'm looking at them. And, and so I call again. It was 45 minutes after I had first called. No help. So this is where you have to, like a landowner. Oh, yeah. You're on your own. Yeah. So you got to make the best decision. So I'm driving, and I was like, the gun needs to go. So I put the gun yeah. right back here. Yeah. I can grab it yeah. if I need it, but this isn't about a gun thing. This sure. is about me 
you know, setting yeah. the principle. And I did the whole, <laughs> you know, drove up behind them. And these kids are smoking weed in the car, you know, being idiots, you know, having fun, whatever. Yeah. And I was like, hands up right now. And both of these kids put their hands up. And they think I'm a cop. <laughs> and I have the call. I have the state troopers on speakerphone because I was like, I called him like, when I go up here, like, I'll put you on speakerphone. You're going to listen to this. So I'm on a recorded line <laughs> taking pictures of their car. Yeah, I have pictures on my phone. I'll show you these two kids, these two potheads, you know, high school kids, their hands up with their eyeballs sticking out. I'm breaking the law, acting like a police officer, basically. <laughs> Screaming and yelling at these kids. You think it's funny what you're doing? Like, when people come here and you're out here harassing them. And I'm just like so fired up. And then it clicked and I go, oh boy, I'm not a cop. Yeah. And then I was like, wait right here. And I come back and the guy's like, are you even a cop? And he was like, hey, you have to tell us because we're being detained. And I go, I'm for service, motherfuckers. <laughs> I was like, hey, keep your hands where I can see them. I got a chainsaw right in the back of the like, truck. For and I was like, get all your drugs and put them on the console now, and I'm not fucking around. And like, you know, you guys didn't know that marijuana was under the U.S. Forest Service. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a natively grown plant. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm thinking like these Where's poor kids. Like, That's I'm, under my jurisdiction. I'm the asshole now. I'm already pulled over. <laughs> <laughs> we can't pull over any farther. So now I like back up, and I was like, "There's a trooper coming up. He's gonna." talk to you and they're like you have to tell us your name and i was like the trooper that's coming up his name's mckenzie uh, Nick Nick Lovin. Lovin. <laughs> i was like and i'm i was like don't you fucking move and so like i'm leaving and i'm like shit oh shit it's like are they gonna shoot me like and i got out of there but then i called the troopers again and i was like and so they were on speaker yeah and i hit end but then i called back and within two minutes troopers showed up yeah and you know I'm sure the process. I'm sure these guys got charged. They're like, yeah, we got some wack up for us. trying to <laughs> say some kids well, smoking weed. The, guy, the kids are like begging well, I, to go to jail I, at I, that I point. I forgot that when I was on speakerphone with the trooper, the trooper goes, hey, man, you're not a cop, so technically you can't do that. You can't and the say kids that. Heard that. You you're can't. like, shut up, get up, again. <laughs> and I, kept, I, I kept referring to myself as over. my license plate. I didn't know what to do. I was like, this is why I see 165. I got him right here. <laughs> over, over. I just kept saying uh, it. It is funny, man, because you go off on a hinge like that, and you're trying not to. Like, your mind is literally saying, like, you can't do You can't help it when you get into that. that yeah. Speaking of state troopers, didn't you kick some state uh, troopers off your land at one point? Oh, this is a good land. Oh, ethics. no. Yeah, so. Trespassing? This, so, our property, like one of my family pieces, borders a landlocked piece of property. Okay. And it's just swamp land. There's nothing really there. Yeah. And I did a timber sale for the neighbor to him. And he would have to go through him, yada, yada. Yeah. You know. So the landowner who owns this landlocked piece said to my dad, and I like, hey, man, I'm landlocked. Like, I want to sell my property. You help me out. You know, you're the neighbor. Like, you know, this, you know, if you want to, and we're like, well, swamp land. There's nothing here. Yeah. So same stand where I had big sides come in. I'm hunting. And I look and I see this guy staring at me with binoculars on my property, just over the line by about 100 yards. And he's looking at me like this, and then he'll take his rattle bag and a rattle and then look back over at me. Like, he's trying to get my attention. So I'm like, I'm like, you son of a bitch. So, like, I get down, and I left my bow, didn't have a pistol, nothing. Just ran right up, and I'm like, shit, I don't have a weapon. And I was like, well, I do have my phone. This is nice. So I took video mode, and I'm like, you know, lower your bow down now. He's on, on your property. On the property. And on the lower property. And so he lowers his bow down. I grab his bow unhook it set it down and i was like get down now and he was like okay and i saw him looking over like this and i look and this is where it could have been dangerous there's another a, guy another guy across the stream has a bow knocked looking right at me and i said you i was like you lower your bow down now and i wasn't on facebook live i lied and i said i'm on facebook live everybody can see what's going on lower your bow down now yeah so he lowers it's a good weapon bow. yeah great weapon it's better than the pistol yeah and I, you know, I, you know, I talked to this guy. I was like, you wait there on the other side. I'm coming back for you. Don't even move. And so, he, you know, the guy was down the other side. I walked this guy to his truck, and he goes, hey, man, my father-in-law told me that I can come over here onto your property. I said, no, he didn't. <laughs> I was like, there's no way that the neighbor who I know. The landlock guy. The landlock guy brought you in here. He goes, well, I'm a state trooper. And I said, okay. 
And he goes, and the guy over there, he's an Altoona Borough cop or whatever. Well, that makes sense. And I was like, that's fantastic. You're like, I don't even like tuna. <laughs> <laughs> Get yeah. down. Yeah. I, you know. you should have been like, you know Jeremy Flynn from it? He was in Altoona for a while. Yeah, he's, he, he, I think he got arrested once. <laughs> Show me the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just like was just so like pissed. Yeah. But I knew like I had to handle this right way. And I'm like, okay, now you're throwing that out. That you're a cop. That's weird. That's evidence. Yeah. So I walk him to his car, take pictures of his license plate, everything. Go down to the other guy. He's winding his shit up. And I'm like, I'm still recording. I was like, don't even fucking think about doing anything. And I'm going to carry your bow out. And I'm carrying his bow. Like, I'm being stern and yeah. direct. But I'm, not, but I'm not being a total flaming like a asshole. Yeah. I'm being stern and direct. Have his bow. He walked out in front of me. And when he would turn around and start to talk, I'd be like, shut the fuck up. I don't want to hear a thing you have to say. Where's your vehicle? Over here. I was like, you parked on the wrong side of the road. I was like, What's going on here? And he goes, well, his father-in-law wants you and your dad to buy that property. And I was like, why would he want my dad and I? And he goes, well, that's why we came onto your property. And, you know, I don't know. My, you talk to him. That's his, his father-in-law is the one that sent us in here. So I get a phone call from the landowner, the landlock guy. Yeah. And he goes, oh, well, I give everybody permission, and I guess we're just going to have issues like that in the future. Best thing you could do is probably buy Oh, so he's trying to and leverage he's it. a real estate agent. <laughs> yeah. So right. his license should be taken. Yeah, for sure. For that. And it's documented, you know, like. Yeah. Documentary now. Oh, he's just trying to leverage it. So you know what I did? I got him Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, and I said, you need to read this book and learn a little bit about land ethics and land management. Unreal, and I'm like, I'm man. your neighbor, man. I was like, you know, you can work with me or work against me. And I was like. But if you work against me, like, it's going to be really difficult. Yeah. And, I mean, it, uh, to be honest, and whether they were smart enough or not, I mean, the trooper and the cop could have got suspended. Sure. Broke a law. Broke the law. Defiant criminal trespass. Not just trespass, defiant criminal trespass. Yeah. But Crazy. the thing is, it's like when that, when that guy, the realtor, came up to me at, at one of the home shows, mm -hmm. I couldn't yell and scream and say anything at him. It doesn't matter home show. I'm representing my business. Sure. But when he came up, he wanted to be all buddy buddy, like it's no big deal. So he got like close to my face, and I go, "Get away from me!" And he thought it was funny, and I went, <laughs> "I just growled at him." <laughs> and he just turned around, and walked away. Like she just bought the swamp land for a thousand bucks. Yeah, I mean, but if you let people know you're a little crazy, well, you you have to be stern. <laughs> stern. Um, you know, in, in fact, most of the people will tell you. Unfortunately, you got to set an example in most cases. Mm -hmm. Meaning, like, if somebody trespassed, even if they didn't true, like they truly didn't mean it. If it just so happens to be the day that you're ready to prosecute, you prosecute. Yeah. And that's so that the word gets out that these people aren't messing around. And they know. Yep. After that, it's community. Yep. Yeah. People talk. People will say, hey, like, don't screw with that because he ain't messing around. And that's that's a standard. That, what happened there to me, was not standard. No. When you're sending in scouts to go over the line just to get kicked off and rattle you in. Stam engine style. Oh, I mean. It's crazy. I can't make any engine jokes. Yeah. <laughs> But my, my we're, baby, getting, we're getting Mike worked up here. My, my baby mama's right. engine, but is she? Oh yeah, she's a scout, she's a Cherokee. Love that. Well, yeah. Well, we better wrap her up. Wrap her up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was fun. Yeah, it was good, man. We appreciate coming in. Uh, where can people check out your business potentially? Yeah, call me uh, anytime. Three sixty five. Uh, my number is seven two four three eight eight forty four sixty. You can 60. also check out millstoneforestservice dot com. There you go. Or check out Mike Lauer on Facebook. I don't know if they want to do that. <laughs> Or, 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 That's where you'll find that video of the <laughs> state trooper trespassing. That's all. Or Millstone Land Management on Instagram, there too. There you go. That'll be good. Well, cool, Mike. We appreciate you coming in, man, and good to spend time and reminisce on the, the good old days. And we'll, we'll do it again here soon. Yeah, we'll have to have you back on the podcast so we can re-dive into the, to the world of conservation here in the near future. No doubt. Thanks for having me, guys. This was a lot of fun. All right, guys. Well, we appreciate everybody. We'll see you next time. Later. It's take me oh.